Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hainsworth Community Education Centre for the Falkirk Council meeting. The agenda was issued last Tuesday, 19th of March, and um, hard copies were made available to members from the Foundry last Wednesday. The, the meeting is being live, stream, live streamed and recorded. A video recording will be posted online shortly after the meeting on the Council's YouTube channel. Today's meeting has a full agenda, and I'm hopeful that business can be completed today if members are disciplined in their interventions. As chair of the meeting, I will look to ensure fair debate, but this will be balanced by the need to deal with the business in hand. There is traditionally some latitude given to the movers of motion and amendments in budget meetings, and I recognise that. However, in debates, I'll be strict and ask members to stick to the allocated time. I also want to remind members of the need to behave in a respectful manner to each other and to officers. We can disagree and no doubt will disagree, but we can do that without questioning the good faith of our officers or other members. I take this opportunity to remind members that all members should be heard without interruption. I will introduce breaks at appropriate stages in the meeting and may vary the order of business in order to best manage the business of today. If members who are attending remotely wish to speak, they should use the raise hand icon. And I will ask all who wish to speak if they have done so before closing the debate. But at that point, it is your responsibility to ensure you attract my attention, even if you have to cut in verbally. Otherwise, you may miss your chance to speak. Members joining you remotely should ensure that the cameras are turned on during the proceedings. And before we start, can all members and officers check now that their mobile phones are switched off or on silent. The first item of business is the Cedar. Mr. Midday will take that. Thank you, Provost. Provost Prisett. Present. Apologies have been submitted by Deputy Provost Balfour. Yeah. Councillor Aitchison. Here. Yeah. Councillor Anslow. Present. Councillor Binney. Present. Councillor Bowes. Present. Apologies have been submitted by Councillor Brown and by Bailey Buchanan. Councillor Bundy. Here. Councillor Colley. Present. Councillor Deacon. Present. Councillor Devine. Present. Councillor Flynn. Present. Councillor Forrest. Present. Councillor Garner. Present. Councillor Hannah. Present. Councillor Kelly. Present. Bailey Kerr. Here. Councillor McCabe. Yep. Councillor Miko John. Present. Councillor Murta. I'm sure. Councillor Emo. Present. Councillor Patterson. Present. Councillor Patrick. Present. Councillor Redmond. Present. Councillor Ritchie. Present. Apologies have been submitted by Councillor Robertson. Councillor Sinclair. Here. Councillor Spears. Present. And Councillor Steinbank. Present. <laughs> hey, thank you. Next item is agenda item two, declarations of interest. Members should declare any financial and non-financial interest they have in any item of business at the meeting, identifying the relevant agenda item and the nature of the interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? Agenda item three, Minutes and Information Bulletin 3A, Minute of Meeting of Falkirk Council held on 6th of December 2023, pages 4 to 28 on your agenda papers. Can we agree the minute? Is there any matters arising from that minute? Councillor Murta. <clears throat> Thanks, Provost. Um, I just I have a couple of questions, and they're just questions for um, information specifically on the minute. So on page six, um, it's SC forty two. So obviously we know that this motion, which was refer which referred to the the bonus recreation centre being kept open, was subsequently superseded by a decision of council on the thirty first of January, and that's noted in the rule and action log. I've got two questions specifically on what's in the minute. Um, and I suppose the, the following minute in, in 31st January says, given the significance of the condition survey, officers had prepared a report that responded to the decision, i.e. of this, this decision. Um, so at this December 6th meeting, just be really helpful if officers could confirm 
if the condition survey by Curry and Brown that was dated 2020, August 2023, which was the new information that was subject to the scrutiny on the 31st, whether that information was in possession of officers at the time of the December meeting. And secondly, that the, the later report, the, the report um, from Development Services in 2019, whether that report was known to officers at the time of the 6th of December meeting. Yes, thanks, Councillor Murta. We'll go to Mr Kedrick. Thank, thank you, Provost. As part of the Curry and Brown report, uh, I had draft and iterations. There was a version available on the 20th of December, but officers were not asked to contribute to that discussion on that on that motion. Um, there was concerns that we had raised uh, uh, regarding that. We did not have, and um, were not aware of at that time, of the 2019 uh, report that was done by uh, our internal engineers at that point. Okay, thanks, Mr Kedrick. Is that satisfactory, Councillor Murta? Yeah, I just wanted to know the information. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, 3B, minute of special meeting of Falkirk Council held on 31st of January. Just, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor McKay. No, it's fine. Um, just on uh, the question that uh, Councillor Murta asked and the response from Mr Ketrick, can I ask um, for clarification when um, the, uh, whatever they're called now, Development Services Report, uh, became, when did we become aware of that and where had it been? Mr Kedrick. We, we, we became aware of the, the 2019 report um, whilst we were progressing through investigations in relation to the, the issue that had been identified by Curry and Brown as part of their, uh, their work. Um, and we undertook a, a search of our, our, our filing systems, which obviously... Um, included information that had been related to the former trust. Um, we managed to uncover that, that report. We engaged with colleagues who were around at the time, um, but we have been unable to identify what specific works uh, have been undertaken uh, since 2019, but we were aware that works had been specified at the time uh, and that there may have been alternatives that were undertaken. And again, you know, we'll go back to uh, what previous we've had in terms of uh, um, information being provided. We're currently working on the basis of the current WSP report, um, which has highlighted the risk, and that was when the decision was taken to, to close the pool. Um, so that, that that's kind of where we are at the moment. Hey, thanks, Mr Kedrick. I can just clarify quite specifically, when did we become aware of the Development Services Report and where had it been? I've, I've got concerns, Provis. This is a document that comes from Falkirk Council, and it's redacted uh, when it's presented to councillors. I'd like to know who the author is of that. We must know it. And who the distribution list was on that. I've got grave, grave concerns about this, Provost. I'll develop the argument further and uh, hopefully in my motion. Thanks, Provost. Agreed. <clears throat> Thanks, Councillor McCabe. Um, 3B, minute of special meeting of Falkirk Council held on 31st of January 2024, pages 29 to 49. Councillor Murta. Yeah, so on um, page pages 30 to 32, it's FC 59. So obviously I, I wasn't regrettably able to be present for that meeting, but I did watch it back and I know what it says in the minutes. And, and what it says in the minutes is it was decided to write to Shona Robinson to advise that in the opinion of the council, the proposed local government finance order for 2024-25 was, as envisaged, was unacceptable. And from my reading of the minute, that actually seems to be a compromise text, text put forward by Councillor Michael John. So I just wanted to um, find out whether there had been any response to that letter uh, since it had been sent. Thank you. OK, uh, we'll go to Mr Perry for a response. Um, Thank you. I can confirm that I, I wrote to uh, Shona Robinson and I haven't received a response as yet. OK, thank you. Um, so, sorry, probably to call you. Um, no, it's just because, I mean, obviously, I think quite a few people have written letters. I wrote a letter, I think, um, Councillors McCabe and Spears wrote, and I did receive a reply, so surprised that Falkirk Council um, haven't received a reply, I suppose it's a bit of a moot point to chase it up now, but um, it would have been nice to see what the response was um, from the Cabinet Secretary, given that this was a matter debated at Council, that's all. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Murta. So, the minute of the special meeting of Falkirk Council held on the 31st of January, can we first of all agree that minute? Agreed. And so, 
In addition to Councillor Murta's comments, are there any comments on that minute? No. Nope. BC, minute of special meeting of Falkirk Council held on 28th of February 2024, pages 50. Yeah, and apologies, I did pick this T-shirt on purpose this morning. Um, so it, it's on um, page 57, um, and it's where the so that's where the minute of decision is of, of what the revenue budget was within this report, um, and it's point four um, of the agreed revenue budget motion. So in summary, um, this had the effect of proceeding straight to consultation on potential changes to the school week, normally known as the asymmetric week. Um, rather than first bringing these for full discussion and development of the proposal to an ECYP exec prior to consultation. So my question is around the validity of that part of the decision, uh, given that elected members make decisions based on the information before us in reports and presented to us in the debate. And the proposal text that was, uh, was supported by an EPIA, which was unfortunately inaccurate and contained missions which were essential for it to be just that part of the budget decision and instead to allow for proper examination and development of the proposal before going to consultation but I've been advised that that motion is still subject to the six month rule and um, so I suppose I want to ask Mr Moody for some clarification around this as to why both a function of the council is allowed to be carried out and is not challengeable given the absence of adequate equalities assessment to support the decision made and that given my motion did not appear on the notice of motion of this meeting to enable me to, to sort of invoke standing order 35.1.3 and put it to the test, which is basically to ask council to reconsider that decision, it's really to kind of get clarification about what my and what our recourse of action could be to have that heard. Because as I read it at the moment, perhaps the only thing that I could then do if I can't put that to the test today, which would be good to confirm is to requisition a special council, given it was a decision of council. Okay, thanks, Councillor Murta. I will go to Mr Moody for comment. <laughs> yes, thank you, Provost. I think there's a number of parts uh, within that question. So, first of all, the first comment I think I would make is the council didn't make a decision to authorise a consultation. The council was informed in the report that there would be a consultation and the council didn't disagree with that proposition. The council had an opportunity to disagree with that proposition because um, if members look at, if they wish to, at page 55 of the minute, they will see that there was an opportunity in the amendment moved by Councillor Murta to take a different view, which was to have the matter placed before the Education, Children and Young People's Executive to allow the terms of the consultation to be agreed. But council didn't take that line and uh, agreed with the uh, alternative motion, uh, which was moved at the same time. So that forms the basis of my view that the council has already taken a decision on the issue which Councillor Murta wishes or wished to place before you today. And that's the reason it was uh, engaged the, the six month rule within your standing orders. I think the point that uh, Councillor Murta is alluding to at the end of her question uh, is in relation to will she have an opportunity at some stage to seek to rely on the third limb of the six month rule, which is that two thirds of the members of the council agree to hear the matter despite it being um, caught by the six month rule that isn't available today because the matter isn't on the agenda, and that I think is the basis for um, Councillor Murta's reference to the potential for requisitioning a special meeting. But that's a matter for members, not not for me. Okay, thanks. Thanks, right. Mr. Murray. So, thanks, Provost. And, and just to clarify, then, so I think, and, and I'm not criticising in terms of you know this is a, a learning process for me certainly as each council goes on in terms of the way that standing orders are put forward and. 
I would have hoped that that motion, despite being subject to the six months rule, could have been on this notice of motion. And I, I believe that had it been, that we could have put that to the test today, but we're not able to. Um, and, and I accept that, that that's what the rules say. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I regret that that is the case because I would have let, I think it's a really, really important issue. So um, from what Mr Moody then said to me, in effect, um, there is still the opportunity to, starting order 35.1.3, to basically put a special requisition to ask that that can go to, uh, that matter can be discussed fully at Education, Children and Young People's Executive. And that would just require the the eight members to, for the requisition then, rather than getting the two thirds to actually requisition the council, is that correct? It would basically be a straight requisition to ask the question and then a asking the question in the special, okay. in a, that would be where we would vote on that, yeah? Is that the case? Okay, we'll go back to Mr Moody. I think, um, like Councillor Murta, we're all in a learning process here as we're stress testing quite how this standing order particularly works. I think the answer is broadly yes to what Councillor Murta is saying. The eight members uh, will requisition a meeting. If the item of business is as contained within Councillor Murta's motion as submitted, it will still be incompetent by virtue of the six month rule unless two thirds of the membership of the council agreed to hear it. So that would be the purpose of the meeting, first of all, to consider whether two thirds of the membership agreed and only if that was the case would the substantive item of business be heard. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thank you, that's helpful. That, that, will, yeah. that will then be my course of action that I will intend to pursue. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Murta. Um, 3D, volume of minutes, volume three. 2023 and 24. Anybody got any comments on that? No. Oh, Councillor Murta, my apologies. Sorry, Hammy Dilly. Um, so it's just, it's actually on, um, I don't have a page number because it's actually on the, the absence of, of the record um, from, from the volume of minutes um, and it's about the education, children and, and young people's exec. So there is no minute to be questioned um, and because the, the business has seemed to be cancelled and I suppose given that there is a significant amount of public interest in this as well, I'd be grateful if officers could clarify why those meetings were cancelled and whether that's common practice as it's the, it's the previous two, two in a row, so we haven't met from since November, we won't meet again till May. And I can't recall a situation where that's ever happened before. So I would like officers to clarify to me that very transparent why that's happened. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Murta. We've got a message for that. I don't think it's working. It's what? Thank you, Prof. Sorry about that uh, mic issue. Um, so there, there was a, a meeting in January and for that meeting there was no business which required member decisions. And members will be aware that we are very keen to ensure that anything we bring to you is something for decision making. But there was no business for that initial meeting at the start of the year that would have required a member decision. For the March meeting, we had intended to bring an item that does require a member decision. But due to the capacity in terms of um, getting that um, particular item around all of our services, it was an important item and it will come to the May meeting. We did not have capacity and time to do that at the same time as us having to deliver on all of the requirements for the budget report in March. So quite simply, it was a capacity issue. Um, those reports will, however, go to the May meeting of the Education, Children and Young People's Committee. Okay, thank you, Ms. Avji. Yeah, Councillor Murta? Yeah, it's it's just to follow up because I think, um, I suppose it's a bit strange given that when we know from our budget context that, you know, more than half of the Council's budget is spent in education, that I think people will find it quite strange, especially just given the matter that we've discussed 
and the many, many parent councils who are now getting in touch saying how important um, certain decisions would be to be able to have or to have, you know, a discussion and bring these things forward that, you know, I think that that, that is a, a regrettable situation because there would have been an opportunity to bring significant matters to such a meeting. But also one thing that personally I'm concerned about um, is I, I quite often, and I'm not criticising because I realise I've got forum on this, um, is that, you know, we bring items to meetings, I think they should be discussed properly and in full and given the full attention they deserve. Um, but when you've got a big agenda, that becomes really challenging. And I can hear the convener's words in my ear about, you know, how we, we can't spend a lot of time discussing things. We've got so much to get through. But that then, if we had two meetings where other things could have been discussed, I understand the, the point about taking things for decision. But what I'm concerned about is when we get to June, are we going to have an agenda where some really crucial, important things, which might just be for information but need time to discuss them, are going to end up with not not having the time? So that's why I'm I'm concerned and bringing that up, and just to make committee aware of that, really. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Mutter. Three uh, E information bulletin. Any questions on the information bulletin? Councillor Lamont. Thanks, uh, Provost. And I have submitted my questions to Mr Moody in advance, uh, so officers should hopefully have the, the answers to them. I'll just run through them one by one. There's four of them. First question is in relation to page five, uh, and it's to do with the pest control uh, contract. Can I get an explanation regarding the points system that's operational with this contract? Mr Gillespie. Provost, thank you very much. Uh, and morning. Morning. Uh, Councillor Nimmo has said I've provided information, but just for committee, this links uh, to the delivery of uh, our community benefits. And what happens is the value of the contract attracts certain points that we then allow our service providers, contractors, to then pick about where they can use these points to deliver our community benefits, i.e. moving from ranges from fundraising to volunteering to sponsorship or to recruitment apprenticeship depending on the size of the contract and the local member uh, was provided a lot more information than that uh, for, for his perusal provost thanks very much mr gillespie council Nemo. thanks mr gillespie for that takes me on to my second question that's in relation to page 12 can I just get officers to confirm what the, the time scales are for the, the Grange North Railway Station STAG report and whether that's fully funded or not? Okay, thanks very much. We'll Mr Kedrick for that. Uh, Provost, the, um, the, 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 the exercise that's been undertaken is not directly related to, to any proposals for Grangemouth Railway Station. What it is is a case for change appraisal um, for the strategic transport assessment. Uh, in relation to Grangemouth, which includes various different forms of transport, of which rail would, would only be one, and it's expected that that will be completed. That first stage uh, of the process will be completed by the end of June, and that case for change element will then advise whether or not a full uh, stag appraisal uh, will then be undertaken, and it is fully funded. It's been funded through uh, the Grangemouth Future Industries Board. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Kedrick. Yeah. Mr. Councillor Nimmo. Thanks for that, Paul. Uh, I've not got any follow-ups in relation to that. My third question is in relation to page 13, uh, and it relates to the, the staff car leasing scheme. Can I just get some information as to what guidance is actually available for staff uh, and whether this scheme just relates to electric vehicles? And if not, why not? And we'll go to Mr. Moody for our response. Thank you, Provost. Uh, there is guidance available on the intranet for all employees, and employees are also entitled to seek guidance from their managers. And there's also guidance available from the HR uh, help desk at any point uh, if employees have a query in relation to the car leasing scheme. On the specific point of does it apply only to electric vehicles, I think I need to take that off table and being I'm being advised that it is, so helpfully I've taken it off table and confirmed that it's even Thanks for that uh, response, Colin. It's appreciated. My last question is in relation to page 18. Can I get an explanation with regard to the, the options appraisal in relation to the museum and archive storage unit currently in Grangemouth? 
why do we need to spend money on something like this when we could probably do it ourselves? Okay, Mr McGas. Yes, thank you to you, Provost. Um, Councillor Nimmo, we acquire some expertise in museum logistics and storage, um, particularly in terms of envi environmental conditioning to look after our many different artefacts that are contained within the Grangemouth facility. As you are aware, the SPR phase three requires us to consider the future of that storage facility. And we have, we've reached out to some external expertise in terms of how do we look at that particular facility, look at various different options and other options that are used across different authorities in terms of how we look after the artefacts and archives we have stored in that particular facility and what facilities may be appropriate in the future. So that's the reason we've, we've gone external for that particular piece of work. Thanks very much for that, Michael. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions on the information bulletin? No. Okay. Agenda item four, rule and action log, pages 61 to 66 in your agenda papers, and questions should be restricted to the comments section. So, our updates only and shouldn't be used to introduce new discussion or open previous debate. Um, so, we'll go to Mr. Moody first. Yes, thank you, uh, Provost. The, the rolling action log is the means by the council by which the council records outstanding actions, whereby it's called by for reports. Because uh, this is a rolling action log which comes after uh, a number of meetings at which there haven't been a rolling action log because there are special meetings, you'll see that some of these are complete and recorded within the rolling action log, and they're there. Uh, for transparency so that everybody knows that the action is complete and they will fall from the rolling action log in its next iteration. There are others which are in progress. Those are noted and there are comments as to the state of progress with the preparation of the report and those are available for questions. Uh, Provost. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Redmond. Uh, just on page 64, I was wondering uh, what actions were being taken? Uh, obviously, with ONS Rex closing, what, what accent, actions are we taking towards uh, rehoming the groups? Um, have we identified the venues? It was obviously when Town Hall closed, we were, there was a lot of effort put into rehoming the groups, and I think we were, it was a bit of success in finding most of the groups are a new home. So, will we be able to find all the groups a new home? And um, what alternative venues might, might that be in? Thanks. Okay, Mr. Kitchen. Uh, thank you, Provis. And similar to the efforts that were made on the town hall, colleagues have been working intensively with a number of groups uh, at, at Bonus Recreation Centre, and I'm pleased to advise that the vast majority of groups will be being found new homes. We have, for instance, the start of the summer swim programme at Bonus Academy uh, starting over the Easter period. There is a number of clubs that are uh, transitioning over over to the academy from the, the middle of April onwards. The active fit um, um, classes are taking place at the, the town hall uh, and there is still engagement ongoing with a number of clubs. We understand that the, the martial arts, the majority of these have re relocated to, to private premises uh, and there is work ongoing by colleagues to continue that, that transition to alternative accommodation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Well, it's just on item 673, which is the implications of the proposal to change to the school week. Can you confirm that report and date? Uh, that report will be coming back to the executive instead of full council. Mr. Moody. Yes, I think the, the date of the 10th of October, if cross reference to the the proposed programme of meetings is to a meeting of the executive, but in that context, it would sit uh, with the additional representatives from um, religious representatives, pupils, teachers and others. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions on the role and action log? Councillor McKee. Oh, sorry, Councillor Murta, then Councillor McKee. Thank you, Provis. Yeah, it's it's on the same item as mentioned by Councillor Steinbank there, and it's just notwithstanding that I've already said I intend to bring a motion to bring the matter to, to education exec prior to consultation. At the moment, 
as the decision stands. Um, could it be, can it be outlined in terms of what's uh, per, um, perceived for the consultation? Um, there was a number of things that were sort of stated that, that perhaps might happen and the, the manner of that. But I think it would be useful to know um, and have clarification since we won't meet again until that happens for full council. Um, what's what's what is the program for going out to consultation as things currently stand? Okay, we've got Miss Alty for that. Thank you, Provost. Um, Provost, the, the there is a great deal of work ongoing at this point in time. We're involving our uh, school-based colleagues, we're involving our communication and marketing colleagues, and also our communities teams colleagues to ensure that we have appropriate uh, professional input and uh, develop a consultation pack and information that will go out. The intention is to commence some of that work after the Easter holidays. So late April into early May, we will start to do some of that work. Uh, we will also get some comms out to our parent councils just to let them know that that's the timeline that we are working to. And we will thereafter um, look at other forms of consultation that there will be an online part of that, but it will also involve employee consultation and pupil consultation. So quite a wide ranging piece of work there with the appropriate professional input from the appropriate teams. So I hope that helps answer that. It does. And th thank you through you, Chair. Um, and I thank um, Rona Jay for giving me a written answer um, to some effect uh, earlier, yes, I think yesterday. Um, I think one of the issues which has been brought up, and I know all councillors will have received, uh, you know, communication from many, many parent councillors on this. But one issue that's coming up over and over is that the Falkirk Area Parent Forum, so the body that represents um, the parents, a uh, unified parent council voice, hasn't met. And I know there's been a number of reasons for that and issues for that, but it makes the development of a consultation um, in terms of how you engage and who you engage with, I think, very difficult. Um, and that that matter is being brought up um, and laid on, you know, very clearly by parent councils that notwithstanding whether it comes back to committee or not, their, en their engagement as parent body uh, in that consultation and being able to inform it is difficult. Can the can can give any um, comment about how that is going to be enhanced um, prior to it going out? Because the, that's the whole point of consultation. And at the moment, I think the avenues which are there um, are very difficult um, and haven't been best practiced so far in this process. Ms. Aldi. Yes, thank you, Provost. Um, Councillor Marta has received a response from uh, Rona Jay on this matter, and she'll be aware that we are in contact with the Parent Forum and are looking at further ways to enhance that engagement and have indeed been in contact recently to try and do that. We're waiting a response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor McCabe. Yeah, Thanks very much, Provost. A um, couple of questions. Um, page 62, uh, proposal to school uh, to close school swimming pools. Um, I see that the uh, status is complete, but I'm aware that there's a report coming back to the executive in 2025. Can I ask, uh, is the proposal to close school swimming pools off of the table now? Yeah, Mr. Bain? You promise. Um, we've just taken a report to council that proposed the means by which to uh, deliver a saving of four hundred thousand um, pounds to settle the budget matter. So um, at this time, our only proposal is to bring a report that updates on how the delivery of that four hundred thousand um, pounds is going. So I, I have no um, proposal at this time to bring any report forward on closing any school pools. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Councillor McCabe. Okay, I think that satisfies. Uh, thanks, uh, Provost. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Um, page 64, it's the um, notice of motion, Bones Recreation Centre. Um, I notice that, um, again, we have the, the status is complete, where we've identified that. Um, an update report was provided on the 31st of January, which superseded the action of the 6th of December 2023. You know that I have uh, issues with that, uh, promised. I'll return to that later. I don't believe that standing orders uh, were followed, and hopefully I'll develop my argument a wee bit later. Um, replacement Town Hall project, uh, the next agenda item on the, the rolling action log. Um, 
I see that um, officers are asking that um, 659 be removed. I would suggest that it should stay on the, uh, the rolling action log because what we have is um, we're now progressing to uh, marketing with officers following evaluation to be considered at a future executive. When can we expect to see that information on this? Uh, when, will, when will we see a tangible offer being made? Mr. Kirkland. Uh, promised um, the site is being marketed and we've had good interest. We've got to enable uh, those interested parties to have the engagement with the statutory stakeholders, including planning on your development proposals, which will um, work towards them being able to present credible offers to us, uh, covering the, the many aspects that will be required uh, to redevelop that site. Um, it would be premature at this point to give a specific time uh, scale for it, but we would be expecting it uh, certainly prior to the autumn uh, this year. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Kirsten. Um, precisely for that answer, I think it should stay on the rolling action log, I promise. And we'll go to Mr. Moody for a response. Yeah, my apologies, Provost. I should have drawn members' attention to that request uh, from officers in the rolling action log. I, I hear that Councillor McCabe is keen that it stays on, but it's a matter, I think, just for general agreement or otherwise by the broader membership of the council. So I think it'd be helpful just to have a sense of um, are people of the same mind as Councillor McKay, but are they content that it goes off the rolling action log for the reasons set out in the request? I think uh, Mr Benny may wish to come in at this point. OK. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, just to uh, explain my view on this action, the action is please can an update come to Council about the disposal of this property? And what we're saying is we can't dispose of that property without bringing a report to council as part of the disposal process. So it's a kind of slightly kind of non-event of, of an action. I have to do this anyway. So um, rather than have it on the action log as a standing item that's brought up at every single meeting, I'm kind of asking for acceptance. Can I just go through the normal standard disposal process that this council has agreed, which will be when we're ready to dispose it, we'll bring a report. Okay, I think what would be helpful, uh, uh, Provost, uh, is if we just put in there the, the status is that we'll get a report back in August, as Mr Ketrick said. That's I'll, fine. I'll ask the uh, council members if they're content to have it removed. Anybody object? No. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. Thanks, Provost. Thank you. Any other questions, Council McKay? So, um, Provost, can I just ask what decision was there? Sorry, you just said... Um, you, you asked um, if anybody wants to change it. Well, I don't yes. think you want to change the item. It was to see if it was to be removed from the rolling action log, if everybody was content with that. Well, yeah, but sorry, I'm just, just double checking that because uh, okay. it wasn't entirely clear. Okay, so my apologies. Okay. Hope that's so, clear. is it being removed then, uh, Provost? Yes, that was the, that's the decision of the council. Fine, okay, thanks. Um, um, just as you say, to cut in, if, if um, just um, I didn't have a problem. I, I'm not, I'm not removing a proposal, or whatever. But I didn't have a problem with it being amended to reflect to understand what Mr. Benny was saying. But I think it could have been, it wouldn't have done any harm to actually just add that to the note on the item, so that it was then kept and refreshed and understood why it was there. So if it's the Royal Council to remove it, fine. But I, I don't think that's really actually necessary. I think it could be, it's better for it to be transparent to stay on. But that's my view. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McCabe, uh, if you're, uh, you st another question, Councillor McCabe? No, that's fine, Paul. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Hannah, then Councillor Spears. Uh, thank you, Provost. I was going to go back to 673, the issue of the school week and the consultation. Um, we have had previous experiences of consultations where there has been a lot of criticism because of the very closed nature of the consultations. Um, so I just want some assurances that this will be a, an open consultation which enables people to say what they want to say and it's not closed questions um, where it's a take it or leave it type of consultation. So I think that's that first of all is important. And secondly, will 
councillors be briefed before the consultation process begins, because I think it is important that councillors are aware of what is going out to their constituents in advance of that process being started. OK, thank you. We'll go to Ms Alvey for a response. Thank you, Provost. Um, as I said uh, earlier, Provost, we are consulting with our communities team around the content of our consultation to ensure that it reflects what we need to do in this respect. The questions, as I understand at this point, and they're still being worked on, uh, will not be simply yes, no questions. They will be seeking views on the proposal. And if there were alternative views that came forward, uh, as part of that process, we would be setting those out and then report back to members with um, the pros and cons of those alternatives for members to consider in the round as, as part of the overall consideration. So I hope that helps to answer that part of the question. Yeah, thanks, Ms Alfie. Go, sir. Uh, thank you, that does help. But uh, there was a second part, which is, uh, will councillors be fully briefed on the nature of the consultation before it starts to go out, so that we know what to expect from our constituents? Apologies, I, I, I remember you did have a second part, my apologies. Um, there is an intention to arrange a briefing for members. We are struggling to find a date because of the number of lunch and learn sessions that are already in members' diaries, but we are indeed looking to get that arranged, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now go to Councillor Spears. Thank you. Uh, you asked if everybody was in agreement that this be taken off the role in action, Rob. Uh, I'd like to record that I'm not in agreement. OK. People, our constituents, they ask, What's a role in action log? And you try to explain that it's a log of actions that are in process. Are you saying the town hall is not in process and it shouldn't be that information shouldn't be in the public domain on a role in action log? Right, so just uh, we've decided that it'll come off a uh, role in action log, uh, Councillor Spears. Thank you. Any other questions? Agenda item five, revenue budget 2023-24 and capital programme 24-25 to 28-29. And it's a report by the Chief Executive, Director of Transformation Communities and Corporate Services and Director of Place Services. And it's pages 67 to 110 on your agenda papers. And Ms Templeman will be speaking to the report. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Um, there are three key elements that are in the report that's in front of you today. So firstly, we have the original capital programme report for general fund capital investment. The report doesn't include uh, council housing investment, which was approved by members in January. And that report set out an affordable level of investment within the capital resources that were understood in February at the time of writing the paper. And the report was continued until today's meeting and was not debated in February. The further two elements propose adjustments to that original capital report, and that's as a result of information received since the February 2024 report. The first of those two elements is the changes to capital funding due to the issue of overfunding for the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme. And the second element is the confirmed funding of 1.77 million from the Scottish Government. So in taking members through the report, I'll go through each of these uh, three elements in turn, starting with the original capital programme. And I would just like to take the opportunity to thank Caroline McGill and her team for their work in pulling the report together, and also the members of the Strategic Asset Modernisation Board who contributed to the work as well. So if I start off with the capital programme, the original report is, is in Appendix 1 to this paper, and that set out the estimated resources and proposed investment. And these figures factor into the prudential indicators, which are used to show that the plans are affordable, prudent and sustainable. The resources at Section 5.2 of the report, which is on page 78 of today's agenda, are estimated at 167 million over the five year period. And the main elements include almost 52 million of capital grants and 105 million of borrowing, with the cost of borrowing reflected in the projected general fund revenue budget and financial strategy that was already presented to members in February. The resources available are finite, 
with grants projected on a flat cash basis and borrowing limited by the impact on the general fund, with the borrowing creating revenue costs in the form of date charges. Paragraph 5.2.13 highlights that if members wish to add new projects, it's recommended this is done through substitution of existing projects. However, this is somewhat superseded by the changes in the later paper, which I will come back to. So in terms of proposed investment, that's detailed in pages 80 to 85 of the report. And I'll not go through that in detail, but there are some specific areas of investment over the five years, which I'll highlight. And that includes funding for the replacement town hall, £35 million pounds on school improvements, including the proposal to extend Cangridge High School and the purchase of the Class 98 schools, £23 million pounds on roads maintenance, £8.3 million on energy efficiency and carbon footprint improvements, and £8.5 million on vehicles, including electric vehicles. There are also some assumptions that are in that report. So an example of that is free school meals, where we don't have the full funding allocation yet. So the level of spend will match the funding allocation, but we don't have some final approval, but we've made some assumptions on what we think that will be. And we'll provide that updates to that in future reports to members. There's a number of projects that are detailed at paragraph 5.4.2 on page 85 of the report, where at the time of writing there was no clear identified funding. And again, the next two elements that are referred to at the beginning will pick up on some of those projects. And at paragraph 5.4.6, the potential ways to fund additional spend have been set out. And as we know, Option C, which is a 1% increase in council tax, will not apply for 24-25, but it is an option that members may wish to consider in future years. And as I previously mentioned, there's a set of potential indicators detailed at page 107. So that's the original report that came to the February meeting. As I mentioned, there's been two subsequent changes to that, and I'll go through each of those in turn. The first is the £4.5 million pounds of funding. So the supplementary budget report to Council in February highlighted that the Scottish Government has to date funded more of the work on Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme than the Council had originally anticipated. The capital programme therefore assumed a level of overfunding and that that would be recovered by a reduction in capital grant in 24-25 and the Council would borrow to cover that. We've now had confirmation that the capital grant won't be reduced and therefore the borrowing that the council was planning to undertake can be re redirected to another priority project. And I think it's important for members to know that this doesn't change the allocation of funding for Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme, which has been agreed at £23.2 million to get through scheme notification stage. So consideration has been given to the treatment of the £4.5 million of borrowing and options are shown at the top of page 70. Officers have proposed that the borrowing is directed towards the Connected Falkirk project. Now, many members will be familiar with Connected Falkirk, but others may not be so aware of the project. So I'll just give a little bit of information on that. So as we all know, digital learning, remote working are now a big part of our lives. And Connected Falkirk plays a really important role in preparing young people to live, learn and work in that digital age. The Connected Falkirk programme contributes significantly significantly to the council plan priority of promoting opportunities and educational attainment and reducing inequalities. And we do that by providing a one-to-one -one device, an iPad to all P6 to S6 pupils across Falkirk, a one-to-one -one device to all the teaching staff in Falkirk, shared devices at a ratio of one to five for our P1 to P5 pupils, connectivity and Wi-Fi infrastructure in schools and libraries, professional learning and digital skills training for all. And this work supports um, the council to address issues of digital exclusion across the area. So the investment connected Walkirk allows us to continue our expansion of our connected learning virtual school offering for senior phase, for example, with the subject choice growing from two in 2021 to nine in 24, 25. And continued investment in Connected Falkirk allows people to access the widest possible subject choice. 
And finally, to note that the impact of connected Falkirk has been noted in all of our nine most recent HMIE inspections, with digital use by pupils and staff now being noted positively or as a key strength, rather than as an area of development, which was the case in inspections before 2020. The final element of the report that I've, put, um, I've brought to you today is the funding announced after the 6th of March spring budget. So that is confirmation of revenue funding of 1.77 million from the Scottish Government. And this is the funding that was referred to in the February budget report, but which could not be confirmed until after the 6th of March UK spring budget. We haven't received our final allocation letter, but we have received confirmation that the funding will be forthcoming, and we've estimated that funding to be at £1.77 million. <laughs> at the February 2024 budget meeting, Council agreed in principle to use 600000 of that funding to support borrowing of £7.5 million for community access to Bonus, Breeze and Denny High Schools. So members have been asked to confirm that in, decision, in principle decision. Options for the application of the remaining funding of 1.17 million are set out in paragraph 5.2.5 on page 71 of the agenda. And that includes the option to support further capital investment of 14.6 million. And the table at the bottom of page 71 shows how that funding could be applied. Members should note that the proposed investment of the subtotal of 10 million on that table is shown in more detail in the appendix to the original capital programme report on pages 99 to 106 of the agenda. The proposal to use this funding for a significant injection of capital recognises the challenge that the Council has with identifying a sustainable investment programme for assets. Whilst the pressure on the revenue budget is enormous, effective service delivery needs good quality assets. And so there's a delicate balance to be struck. Officers have therefore recommended the priority projects that they believe are required to help sustain service delivery. And my colleagues from across the services are here to help answer any project specific questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ms. Templeman. Uh, before we go to Councillor Mick, we're going to see Councillor Spears who's got his light on. Do you got a, a question, Councillor Spears? Yes, uh, I've got a couple of questions, if it's okay. What's the time? Uh, no, uh, you can ask him when we come to the uh, debate. Well, I'll allow the okay. uh, leader of the administration to speak first. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Mick, will join. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Provost. <clears throat> And I just want to say thanks to um, Mr Templeman um, and Mr Clearney and indeed all of the team um, involved in pulling the capital programme budget together, as well as the senior management team um, who have had a significant role um, in, in actually um, developing this. Uh, capital finance, we know, uh, continues to be pressured um, with the Scottish Government's capital being significantly cut by the UK Government at a time when investment is needed to, to, um, to prevent further dips in recession. Fortunately, that's not been recognised um, with no additional capital funding being made available in this, uh, the UK spring budget. Inflation has remained stubbornly high um, as of interest rates. Therefore, um, there continues to be a volatile financial climate and it's likely to be that way for some time yet. We are therefore have to continue to rely on short-term borrowing to support our capital programme, which limits the borrowing abilities. Construction inflation, while it has come down a bit, remains high and higher than pre-COVID, and as a result, you get less for your money with projects costing more. Currently, there's little capacity to expand the capital programme significantly. However, um, the administration recognises that there is a need for investment. Um, the recent condition survey of the SPR highlighting the high costs of not keeping abreast with non-essential aspects of building maintenance over a sustained period of time. Aging buildings that are nearing, the end of, uh, nearing or at the end of life are no longer fit for modern day purpose, as well as being inefficient to manage. And as we look at other assets, uh, a further need for investment, particularly in our learning estate, will also be required. And I know that work is ongoing at this moment to determine exactly what requirement will be, requ be needed and inform our future capital going forward. 
as it's important that we look to address this in a planned and managed way, which is why the revenue budget, um, there was a proposal to set aside a near-marked reserve of service concessions, and at this stage, a notional vision of what we might use those for in order to give confidence to our communities that we are thinking and planning ahead. This should also enable us to have shovel-ready projects um, on the shelves so that should there be any additional funding made available to bid for, um, we can maximise our opportunities as well as augment our existing capital rolling programme, which currently has a commitment of investment of £167 million over the next five years, which includes £45 million for the U-Town Hall, £22.7 million extending Cairn Grange School to a multi-year campus, as well as £5.5 million to purchase the PFI schools and 8.3 energy efficiency and carbon footprint works, just to highlight a few. Following the confirmation of the additional funding from the UK consequentials and additional funding from Scottish Government, which met almost the same as what would have been in the Labour Amendment had the council tax been raised, which amounts to 1.77 million. At a budget meeting on the 20th of February, it was agreed in principle to use 600,000 to support capital investment of 7.5 million for access to schools programme for the Brazen Denny, added to the 3 million for bonus. And today we would look to confirm that funding allocation, allowing these projects to begin in earnest and to look and I look forward to the detailed proposals coming forward in the near future. The remaining 1.71 million, the remaining 1.17 million, sorry, um, too many sevens in all of this, um, well, that could be used to reduce the use of service concessions. There, however, remains an expectation by our communities to meet some critical needs. Therefore, that additional funding should be used to support further capital borrowing. Officers had developed a wish list of areas of priority spend, recognising that our communities need to see improvements in investment. And while it will not be enough, and we know it will not be enough, it will start to begin to make a difference and bring some added value. Therefore, we propose, in addition to the existing rolling programme, that the priority projects of investment of £22.5 million, as detailed in Section 5.3.2, be agreed. Following representation to the Scottish Government in relation to the over-allocation of the of the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme of five of four point five million, um, and the co confirmation requiring that this not is required not to, that this is not to be repaid, and given flexibility how it can be used, it is very welcome. Having been a pioneer in developing digital virtual learning which has been acknowledged by Scottish Government and HMIE, there is a significant need for replacing the 17,000 iPads, which would then, and using that funding to do that, this would then give time for a future rolling replacement programme to develop for the future. Uh, I therefore propose that the 4.5 million be used to support the Connected Falkirk programme. With the additional investment, um, we'll bring our capital investment plans to 194 million across the Falkirk area over the next five years. And in addition to the areas already mentioned, it will give an agreed investment in sport and leisure in secondary schools of, of the 3.0 million plus the five point of the 7.5 million for community access to the Braze, Denny and Bonesse. And cycling, walking and safer routes to schools of 1.7 million and structural maintenance and roads and street lighting of 20.5 million, as well as the 4.5 million to connected Falkirk. I therefore move the following motion um, in relation to the recommendations. One, to approve the capital programme as set out in Appendix 1 of the report. Note the position in the capital grant funding in relation to the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme. Agree to use the overfunding of the 4.5 million from the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme to support the refreshed connected Falkirk programme. Note the information from the Scottish Government on the additional funding from 6th of March 2024 spring budget and agree the in principle decision taken on Council on 28th February 2024 to use the, point, the 600 of funding to support borrowing for 7.5 of school sports facilities and agree to ring fence the remainder of the additional 1.17 million to support the capital investment and agree the projects as set out in 5.3. Therefore, move the motion provost. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Councillor Michael John. Have you got a seconder? Uh, thank you, Provost. And if I may, can I highlight a few areas? 
Council previous, previously made the commitment to deliver improved community access to sport and leisure facilities at Bonius Academy, Denny and the Bays High Schools. It has become clear to the administration that there is a great opportunity to make a further extremely significant investment to deliver substantially larger and improved facilities to support community access and enhance the sport and leisure offering. The proposed total investment of £10.5 million will enable delivery of substantial extension to Bonius Academy, which will improve in some of the facilities provided at the Recreation Centre, including a more modern and larger fitness suite, in addition with the access to the swimming pool, large game halls and other appropriate accommodation together with the modernisation of engine facilities. The Council will deliver a facility that will be more sustainable and provide the capacity for growth and subject to viability, further investment in the location with appropriate community partners such as local clubs. The emerging proposals will provide additional opportunities for the skill to enhance their sport, leisure and wellbeing offering over the longer term. It has been identified a real need for investment in a couple of areas and proposals for investment at Braes and Denny are at early stages with appraisals on demand and opportunities to deliver community accessible sport and leisure facilities at initial design and feasibility stages. Options being considered are varied and will be tailored to each location. It's proposed that once proposals have been developed to a greater level of maturity and consult consultative briefings will occur with elected members and then subsequently with key stakeholders and communities. The £10.5 million investment proposed will be a huge boost to the provision of sport and life facilities and is compatible with the emerging proposals from the Policy Development Panel. Another project that is dear to my own heart is the Den Eastern Access Route and it is great to see the progress being made with the completion expected in June this year. The project will greatly reduce the congestion at the Glasgow Road Broad Street Junction at the town centre, as well as relieving pressure on other routes, the Drove Loan, for example. An additional £4 million has been added to the road's maintenance budget, which I'm sure all road users will welcome. And nearly £1 million has been allocated to Bonnybridge and Slamanon for community regeneration. Consultations have taken place with communities, and it's encouraging to see proposals now taken forward. Indeed, it's particularly welcome that funding has been used to acquire the former Royal Hotel in Slamanon that has for many years been in a derelict condition and an eyesore for the village centre. I understand that a demolition contract has been let and works will begin in mid-April to commence the demolition and clear the site. Proposals for the area will be consulted upon with the community. Happy to second these very positive recommendations. Hey, thanks very much, Councillor Garner. Then we'll just go around the group where you'll see if there are any amendments coming. Councillor Hannah. No amendment. Hey, really care? No amendment, Provost. Councillor Spears? Uh, no amendment, but I have questions. OK, thank you. And uh, any other independent members perhaps have an amendment? Councillor I perhaps have an amendment that's been previously circulated. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Murta. So we'll go to Councillor Hannah. Uh, I just have a few questions to... Uh, uh, if I may. Um, thank you, Provost. I mean, first of all, thank you for this report. And I, I can see there's been a tremendous amount of work put in by all officers on this and uh, in very difficult circumstances. So well done to all concerned. But I would like to just get some clarification. Um, I am right in understanding that as a result of the Scottish Government settlement, there was £900,000 being taken out of the capital budget and that the proposal here is to use some of the additional monies that came as Barnet consequentials uh, from the UK Government that is going to reinstate that cut in the capital budget. Can I be clear about that? Okay, Ms Stapleman. Uh, thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Anna. Yeah, so there's been a, a £819,000 reduction in our capital grant. So when we were looking in the original report at the potential of increasing council tax by 1%, which would give us £10 million, and that's in a detailed appendix, um, that included um, using 900000 to try and reinstate that reduction. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Going back to that 1.77 million, which is being coming forward, can you tell me what guarantees we have that this is recurring funding? Um, because I have not seen anything um, 
concrete about it being recurring and it is my understanding that's only if it's recurring that we can use it for borrowing. Could you clarify that please? Thank you. I think um, you're you're correct, the letters haven't been very specific about it, um, but what we have is um, correspondence between COSLA and the Scottish Government, where COSLA have sought the same um, reassurance from Scottish Government and Scottish Government have confirmed that it is the um, the funding will be baselined. So um, that's our that's where we're taking that assurance from. Right, thank you very much. Um, now, on page 71, there's reference to uh, a million pounds required for Madison Primary School extension. Uh, now, when this report came out was the first time that I was aware that this was an issue for the capital budget. And I wonder if we could have a little more clarity where this requirement has come from um, and how it has appeared at this late stage in the process. OK, I'll go to Ms. Aldi to answer that. Thank you, Provost. Um, Provost, this is a project that started in 2020, so it's now been underway for a few years. We are nearing completion of this project and we're hoping that this the extension will be complete for the new um, academic term in 2024 this year. Um, the actual overspend was identified earlier this year but wasn't, we didn't have detail that we could have put into the, cap, the original capital report that came to members at the end of February. We now have that detail, so it was felt it was appropriate to put it into this report. There are various um, reasons we believe the extension has occurred, but we do want to get to um, the background of that overspend. So for those reasons, I've asked our internal audit team to undertake an audit of the overspend so that we can learn lessons from that to ensure that that type of situation doesn't occur uh, in the future for other contracts. Thank you. I look forward to um, reports of how that has come about. Uh, I just have two other questions, if I may, Provost. Um, first of all, still on page 71, um, there's the 4.5 5 million being added into the roads budget, um, which obviously will be welcomed by the many people who complain on a regular basis about the condition of our, of our roads. Can you confirm this is a one-off increase and that it will only occur in 24-25 and then that the budget will thereafter return to the lower amount, please? Ms. Templeman. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the um, the structural world works of four million at the top of the table is is a one year. Now, whether some of that ends up being split between 24, 25, 25, 26, just because of timings, I think we, we'll we'll have an, a better understanding of the planning um, goes on. But it is just a one time injection of four million pounds. And I think that goes back to what I was saying in my presentation about when we come back to the capital programme, in future years, members may want wish to consider that recurring allocation of um, potential accounts tax increase to support capital investment. But at this point, it's just a one a one year agreement. Thank you. Um, and just just finally, um, when we met on the 28th of February, the report that you gave us said the most sustainable and prudent way to set a balanced budget and address the budget gap is to reduce incurring, recurring expenditure or increase income. And realistically, that both would be needed. Uh, can I um, clarify, given that the council tax decision that on the 28th was to accept the council tax freeze, do any of the proposals before us today change this position and make the budget into the future more sustainable? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hannah. I think, um, as, as I mentioned at, at the start, it's, it, it's quite a delicate balance that needs to be struck because the reality is that if our assets um, are not of good quality and don't support us to deliver services, then that will in the long run have another cost to us. And we've talked about that as a council before. We talked about it as scrutiny with the roads investment and, and the, the issues that that can lead to. So I think it, on page 71, we have been quite clear that there's 
options at paragraph 5.2.5 of what how this funding could be spent. Um, I, I think it's difficult to see that there's one option that's the correct option. Um, I think there's no perfect answer because we're facing challenges on both revenue and capital. Um, so I think what's in front of you today is a pragmatic approach to trying to um, inject some much needed investment into assets. But I think our position overall in terms of the revenue uh, challenges, the need to increase income and reduce expenditure still stands. Those messages remain the same. OK, thank you very much and thank you, Provost. Hey, thanks very much, Councillor Hannah. And I think perhaps I should have went to Councillor Murta in the first place before going round the group leaders to find, since she's got an amendment, so would you like to take this opportunity to speak to your amendment, Councillor Murta? Um, I will, I just turned to me, I will move my amendment, but I'm happy if others want to ask questions. I don't know that other people have had their light on, so I, I don't have an objection to that and I don't think it would... It would um, mess things up as it were but it's up to what the process is i'll be happy to follow okay thanks councillor martin we'll go to bailey care who's just got out of seat <laughs> my boys i'll come back sorry if it i'll go to councillor spears thanks yeah councillor spears yeah yeah i'll ask him now that's yes right. thank, happy thank you. Ask you. much graciousness Yes, Much absolutely. Always gracious, Councillor Spears. OK, if we can look at page 82, 5311, Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme. Here we have another year. Here we have more delays. Do we have, question one, an update from the Scottish Government when funds will be provided? I would hate the people of Grangemouth to think that the flooding of their town is not as important is building a new town hall. This money, there's three point, sorry, 2.9 million. What is this money being spent on? I think we've had a level of consultation. We've had um, as many requests for comments. We've had meetings and briefings in the town hall. We want to know when it's going ahead. I published a picture on social media where the Grange burn is 10 centimetres from overflowing. Now, we all know the River Forth and the Forth Estuary in the North Sea is increasing in height by 10 millimetres. So that gives us, not being a mathematician, 10 years to put some form of serious action in place we already have the trees at our burn bank dying because of the high salt content. And I must admit to my colleague, Councillor McCabe and Councillor Gardner and Councillor Colley, I'm glad you're getting your Eastern Access Road, but they've just completed the drainage. And as we all know, water flows downhill, so Grangemouth will handle all your wastewater it will help increase the ever-increasing water table in the area. So, so and, would you like the question answered, Councillor Your first question, do you want me to go to Mr Bennett to answer your first question? Well, yeah, but I've got more questions to come. Okay, so, okay Mr Bennett, would you like to tackle Mr mm -hmm. Kedrick? Uh, Provost, as members of the Council Executive will be aware, back in January we provided an update report on the progress being made on the delivery of the Grangemouth Flood Protection Works and as part of that uh, there was a commitment given by the Scottish Government to establish a task force. Myself and other officers have met with uh, colleagues from uh, the Scottish Government and that task force is in the process of being established and that will look at uh, the proposals for taking forward the flood protection scheme. Okay, thanks uh, Mr Kedrick. I, I can only say we've been looking at that for four or five years now and have decided to form a task force now. I think they really need to get their act together and move a bit faster on that. My second question is on the digital learning and Wi-Fi in town centres. I think most people agree if you go into any of the shops in Falkirk and Grangemouth that they can't get Wi-Fi connection. They have real difficulty with the, um, people who want to pay the card digitally. 
that they can't use the digital machines for paying because the town centre Wi-Fi is so poor that they can't get a signal or they can't get a signal through to their bank. So what we have assurances that this money we've spent has been well spent and that the system actually works. Thomas, the connected Falkirk uh, monies that are in the report are actually in relation to um, iPads and laptops for children in schools. So it's specifically about the provision of that equipment for the benefit of the learning and education of our children and young people in schools. It, that doesn't relate to the Wi-Fi situation across um, our communities. That's not what that um, project is related to. Thank you. Sorry, Miss Alger, you did mention it in your briefing. Or um, and Amanda mentioned it in her briefing about town centre Wi-Fi. I think I'm, uh, Councillor Spears, I think I was referring to the libraries because the libraries have been equipped so that if children go into the libraries with their iPads, they connect automatically to the library Wi-Fi so that they can study in the libraries. Um, I can um, ask some questions about uh, the, the town centre Wi-Fi and come back to you. I'm not aware of particular issues that have been raised, but I can look into it and come back to you. Right, no, that's super, but I would hate to think our shopkeepers are having to run into the library to get their um, pay-by-cash machines to work. The leader of the administration said in a delivery that this is, we need to develop these things. The problem is, there's a lot of talk, but no much development. So we need to start putting timescales against what we wish to do, not just that we're going to throw cash at stuff, but that we actually want to see stuff completed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Spears. <clears throat> um, go to Bailey Cairn now. Uh, thanks, uh, Provost. Uh, I've got a couple of small statements, then I've got questions for, for officers, if you the your indulgence. Promised 17,000 iPads for our school learning estate has been inspirational for our pupils and staff. Uh, we have, as has already been quoted, we have put our money where our mouth is regarding this. We have been commended by the Scottish Government's Education Minister and Apple for being so forward thinking. However, there's only four local authorities who have risen to this challenge. And I'm sure this was a, man, a, a manifesto promise that all schools or all, all children will have an iPad. I'm just asking, when will the money come to the Scottish Government? Because it's their promise. Also, this is going to be a recurring uh, theme every five years. So we will have to fork out the money every five years to update. We are, we are happy to do that because the benefits uh, enormous, especially through the time of COVID, where we had the opportunity, our, our young children, kids had the opportunity uh, to use the digital learning, uh, so it benefited us. So what I'm asking is, first question, when will we get money from the Scottish Government as promised? Okay. Ms. Templeman. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, uh, Bailey Care. At this point, we don't have an indication of when we could expect funding from Scottish Government for the digital devices. I think, as we've talked about earlier today, there's um, real challenges with capital funding, um, and and so we haven't had any any confirmation. We understand that there's um, funding of around ten million pounds has been 
provided to Connecting Scotland for Connecting Scotland to look at um, digital devices and digital um, exclusion issues. We have made representations to the Scottish Government that we would like to be um, more involved in that discussion because of the sort of unique set of circumstances in Falkirk um, and how we already deliver devices um, and the Scottish Government have indicated that they were open to that um, so so we're, that's something that we'll be taking forward with them um, but as I say that's that's £10 million nationally clearly the um, the wider digital device for every, every pupil is not going to be covered by that and we don't have a time scale for when we will um, get funding on that. Thanks. Is a supplementary question for that, Provost? Carry on. I reckon you've, by the time we use this money, I'll be £17 million pounds we have used approximately to bring this digital learning to our uh, schools. The £10 million is not going to go far if the other, 32, the other 31 local authorities are trying to do the same. So, I think the funding, and I don't know who, is there any indication when this money will come forward, if at all? Ms. Aldi? Um, Provis, we don't at this point have any indication of any further funding for the Connected Falkirk project, or, and we don't have a time scale over which we would see any additional funding coming for that. Um, I think that's why we've put this into the, the proposals in the report. Um, I think it's also worth flagging that that does help with inclusion, and that's why we have suggested to the Scottish Government it would be good to work with them on that particular project. But we've also um, distributed some devices, etc., for inclusion purposes through some of the work that our communities team are doing as well, beyond uh, those which the, the children have received. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Karen. I know that we say one in five at the primary school uh, are allocated, but a lot of the high head teachers in these primary schools understand how important they have and have actually used their perf money to buy more because they know how viable this is for uh, the children. Right, okay. The next one is uh, a couple of comments. Royal Hotel in Slamanen coming down in the middle of April. Uh, you don't understand how much that is a godsend to the people of that village. Uh, and through the work and consultation that's been happening with officers, the local community will decide what happens when it comes down, which is great. The £10.5 million pounds for sports and leisure for various areas around Falkirk can only be commended by this, for everybody in this council. We keep on, well, the communities think we keep on beating them and beating them and beating them. This is showing them that we're trying to put something back into the communities. Uh, with regards to, a, a question, with regards to the 5.32, and page 71 with regards to the, the bottom piece where it's 3.6 reinstating the existing rolling programme that's been in existence uh, is that covered in the pages 8 to 81 or what is the existing rolling programme ok Mr Temple Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Billy Kerr. Um, the the rolling programmes are the series of, of work that we do to really retain and support business as usual. So it's our street lighting, it's our roads, it's our bridge maintenance, it's our backlog maintenance for property, um, it's our ICT investment and refresh of devices and things. So they're really the kind of the thing that keeps our businesses, our services uh, moving. We when we had the um, reduction in capital grant for 24-25, 
we, the only option really available to us was to sort of pro-rata a reduction across those rolling programmes because obviously the bigger projects have sort of contracts and agreed budgets associated with them. So um, if we, what we're proposing on page 71 is that we rebuild the rolling programmes back up to the levels that they were at before that 820,000 roughly cut uh, was taken off them for each of the next five years. Yeah, that was as clear as mud to me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're saying is it was back into the, the capital programme. Yes, so it's um, it's just sort of spread across all of those programmes, bridges, lighting, um, right, okay. buildings and roads. There, there, are, there are things that I'll take offline with the various departments to understand, because there's there are big numbers for specific programs, but I just want to get a I want to get a, a better idea of, of what's planned in case I get asked, like the one for energy efficient and carbon reduction, eight million pounds. So I'll take all these offline and I'll get contact the services who are who are relevant to it. Just my my final uh, one on page eighty five where the uh, backlog maintenance school estate is my only concern or one of my concerns circa eight two hundred million pounds which be very challenging. Very challenging. Uh, the rest we can work on, but I think that will be the most challenging part when the report comes back. Thanks very much, Provost, for your indulgence. Yeah, thanks very much, Billy. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Councillor Bundy. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, building on that point from Councillor Kerr, if you go to 5.4.2, you'll see that if you add the backlog maintenance for the school estate and the backlog maintenance for non-education, the funding gap is over a quarter of a billion pounds. Um, the maintenance, the minimum investment required is 279.7 million and only 24.9 million pounds has been budgeted for until 28-29. That's a staggering figure, over a quarter of a billion pounds of a maintenance backlog that needs um, to find funding from somewhere. And I think that fits into a growing consensus within, or within the population that the council is not managing the assets well enough, that we're allowing buildings to deteriorate. And to add to that, so I want to quote from 5.4.3, which says, um, it is inevitable that the condition of assets across the council will deteriorate. Um, that, that just quote. So many people are asking, why is the council going ahead with fast expenditure of new projects when there's over a quarter of a billion pounds of maintenance backlogs in current assets? So could somebody answer that question, please? Mr. Bain. Through you, Provost. Could I just clarify, Councillor Bundy, which projects you're specifically referencing when you're saying we're about to invest lots of money in projects at a time when? Um, so, in the emails that I've had, um, New Market Street has come up quite often, Town Hall, and the the knowledge that there might be additional twelve million pounds being asked for for that. Um, that's the two main ones that have come up to me um, so far. Okay. Um, well, it, it was my understanding, obviously, the Newmarket Street project pre predated me, but it was my understanding that there was a recognised issue with the way that buses were 
you know, moving in that space that needed to be addressed. And that was the purpose of that project. That project in itself from memory was um, around about £800,000. So um, I don't in any way mean to suggest that um, that's not a significant amount of money, but I don't think it, you know, having not done that project would not fix the, um, you know, 200 50 million pounds of backlog maintenance that we're talking about. But if you want additional information about that particular project, then I would seek to get officers to tell you about it. With regard to the town hall, I think we've made the case on numerous occasions about the regeneration benefits for Falkirk that the new town hall will bring. Um, and elected members have repeatedly sort of raised their sort of um, support for local groups that want to use the facility as well. Um, but ultimately, council will decide on that project when we bring forward a proposal with a fully costed sort of model. And that will be the point at which you as elected members make that judgment call on whether you're wanting to invest that money on a town hall or something else. But at the moment, the stated opinion from council is that we're progressing with that project. I raised those two examples because those are two examples that are quite recent in people's minds, but you don't get a quarter of a billion pound of a maintenance backlog overnight this has happened for various reasons over a very long period of time and people are coming i think closer to opinion they want a change of direction from this council to actually focus on the assets that we've got um and just to add to the point that um, councillor spears um, made regarding gradual flood protection scheme i think it's um, fair that I update the council. So I did write to John Lamont MP asking for UK government involvement. He responded saying that it is a devolved matter and the UK government would not get involved. I was not happy with that reply. So I wrote back saying that's not good enough. Um, I want to have a meeting and that meeting did take place last week. Um, so I got to speak to John Lamont for about 30 minutes um, giving my opinions and my group's opinions about why it's um, vitally important for the UK government to invest in what is national infrastructure for Scotland. Um, no commitments were made, but those arguments were put forward in person. Well, thanks very much, Councillor Bundy. Councillor Stainby. I think Mr Benny might have wanted to come in just on that point. My apologies, Mr Benny. Uh, thank you, Provost. I, I, I just wanted to address the point that you raised about you know these assets didn't get to this state overnight um it's my view that um obviously Falkirk council has had low council tax rates it's you know either been the second or you know we're currently sixth lowest council tax rates for not just one year for for years and years and that means that there is less money to reinvest in that estate there's an, and so i think in answer to questions about why assets are in the condition they are. It's not because um, uh, any sort of, it's not because officers haven't, you know, maintained them. They've maintained them as well as they can with the money that is there. But a uh, decision's obviously been taken by council over a number of years to keep local council tax. And some of that was due to national policy, but um, the council tax rates were low and that means there's less investment that you can put into the estate. But I think that in recent years we're seeing a positive change to that and directly that's addressed in the report today. Just to respond to that quickly, for maintenance backlog for non-education, budgeted 23-24 zero, budget, a proposed budget 24-25 to 28-29 zero. I don't know if that's a change of direction. It is. Want to respond to that, Mr. Bailey? With respect, we've made the case already that we're doing condition surveys on all properties to identify where our particular problems are. And then we will come back to council with an ask of what we will do with that. But we can't ask for money before we know what we need to do and what we can deliver in the uh, current, sorry, 24-25. So you need to find the problem and then you need to plan that problem to be fixed and we normally would get access to schools over the summer there's not a problem there's not a possibility for us to significantly invest in that school estate or the um other estates 
in that summer period, but we will be returning to council. Um, and I imagine if there is the stated um, proposal that Amanda's referenced about potentially adding uh, a 1% on council tax in future years to fund additional investment in capital, that a significant proportion of that would be recommended by officers to go exactly in those places. Yeah, Mr. Lord, I'd like to come and say a few words. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Professor. Just very briefly, I think the thing that signifies the change of direction really is the strategic property review. For all of the difficulties uh, and challenges of that, this is about the council finally getting to grips with the fact it needs to take a long-term planned approach to property, both the development of, of new solutions and the resolution of some of the longer-term uh, issues which Councillor Bundy refers to. I think that is a really um, significant change of direction. And the truth of the matter is that this council is behind the curve in terms of these long-term decisions about its assets and its property. <clears throat> and the fact of the SPR is us beginning to really get to grips with that in my in my view. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Laurie. And we'll now go to Councillor Steinberg. Yeah, thanks, Provost. I'll just join the comments made on Connected Falkirk. I've seen the benefit of Connected Falkirk firsthand and its positive impact has been commented on by many many secondary and primary teachers I've spoken to, especially in support and transition for our young people in later phase in primary. Look, Perhaps the points made for further engagement from COSLA to the Scottish Government on the national commitment might be a route to be considered to hold them accountable to this. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, it was point five, point four, point six of the capital programme, and that was from the report back in February. It was additional borrowing cannot be considered prudential unless significant savings or additional income is identified. It's just a question for greater detail on why this additional borrowing is considered prudential. Thank you. OK, Ms Templeman. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Steinbank. Um, I think what that paragraph on PG6 is referring to is that you, if we borrow, we need to know how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to meet the borrowing costs. And effectively, the the uh, pr the, the proposal in front of you today is to use that 1.7 million to pay those borrowing costs. So borrowing can be considered prudential if we know how we're funding it. Um, if we are um, simply adding to the burden without that identified funding, that's when I think we would have to say it's not prudential. And that's why the um, recommendations at that point in time were to say we would need to substitute projects rather than just add into to the programme. Thanks very much. Um, probably just a follow up question. Would it be considered prudential then if we borrowed against the same balance of service concessions or, or look to the revenue budget for additional borrowing costs? Thank you, uh, Provost Council Team Bank. I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I, I quite follow <coughs> the point with, with service concessions because I think service concessions effectively are is borrowing. So we have to borrow to have the service concessions, as we've, we've talked about. Um, so again, it's, it's simply saying that if we borrow, we are going to incur interest costs, repayment costs and we need to know how we're going to fund that um, so so anything that we add into the revenue budget needs to be backed by either that income or saying we will make this reduction in our costs and we will use that reduction to pay for the borrowing and that's why um, the proposal to for example clear you've got additional income coming in you can use that to support the borrowing um, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question but I may have not quite understood it. I think it satisfies my understanding of the slight change in thinking and the slight differences between that report and the previous report. Um, I think there are several ruling items here, obviously, as Councillor Hannah has commented on, and the roads budget will require ongoing additional investment beyond this year. And as we've seen, priorities such as the Madison Primary School extension will be brought up in year. We will have further work to do in ensuring the essential connected fall cut scheme uh, that I think we've got cross chamber uh, support for. Um, retaining can be maintained and we need further additionality as has just been commented on to maintain our school buildings. Uh, I think from this debate cross chamber understanding is we can't let our statutory responsibilities like roads or school buildings sit in the state of manage to climb. I think our question is how will officers recommend that we pay for this going forward if we continue to understand that we need additional Scottish Government capital money coming forward. Thank you Provost. 
provost, um, there is work being done to look at the conditions of the schools, as um, Mr Berry has stated. So once we have that, there needs to be a plan drawn up that will be over a number of years. That then needs to be balanced off with a capital plan that sits alongside it. That would come to members for consideration as part of a strategy to deal with our learning estate and to ensure that our school buildings are to the standard that we would expect them to be for educational purposes. I'm glad there is that long term view being considered here. Thanks, Provost, for that question. Thanks for Thank very much, Councillor Stan Bank. Councillor Nemo. Thanks, Provost. And it's just a, a point on the back of what Mr. Benny was saying there. Uh, and Malcolm, I fully appreciate you can only budget with what you're, you're given. And you did mention council tax and the fact that we were sitting bottom lowest uh, for a good number of years. This is on the back of a 10 years council tax freeze imposed by the Scottish Government and we we'll also have the, the council tax frozen for the coming year as well. I think this has got to be laid squarely at the foot of the, the Scottish Government. Uh, we've had 17 years of constant budget cuts to our revenue and capital budgets and that's going to be going on for a considerable period of time to come. So the problems the Scottish Government's they need to sort it out. The promise does something totally different in relation to council tax. They've failed there again. They've offered nothing. Uh, and until something's done nationally, we're going to stay in the same position. Sorry. Thanks, Mom. Thanks. Yes, yeah, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Nimmo. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Murta. Do you want to now speak to your amendment? Okay, could we circulate the amendment, please? Is it just while it's being circulated, Provost, I wonder Thank if it's help, helpful to ask, just ask some questions first, if that's oh, possible. Okay. But... Could you say that again, Councillor Murta? Sorry, um, I just while it's being circulated, could I just uh, potentially ask some questions related to the report rather than my amendment while, while it's being circulated? Is that okay? Okay. okay. Before that but, um, happens, Prov Sorry, uh, Provost, just before that happens, if I could maybe just finish the, the round robin of questions just before uh, Councillor Murta's comments uh, and uh, motion comes in. Uh, my apologies. No, it's, fine. No, it's, no, it's absolutely fine. Problem. It's not a problem. Um, so Councillor Murta has some questions on the report, I believe. So is that what you want to ask first? I do, but if it's easier for me just to do it all in one, I'm happy to, for Councillor McCabe uh, to go first. It's absolutely I, I fine. I think so. OK, we'll go to Councillor McCabe. Thanks, Councillor Murta. Thanks, Provost. Um, I've listened uh, quite intently to some of the... Uh, the comments expressed and Councillor Bundy made some excellent points, I felt. Councillor Nimmo um, followed up on some of those points. And when he quoted Mr Benny, who had illustrated how all local authorities have been suffered from the council tax freeze. And we know it sounds a good a good option when you talk about we're not going to increase council tax for the members of our local authority. That sounds great, but we've seen it time and time and time again what the impact is of council tax to local authorities. I've tried to express it on a number of occasions so all we're doing is kicking this can down the road. We're going to come back to this next year and we're going to have to increase council tax by more than we would like because we don't have the funds in place. I'll just move to uh, a couple of the questions that I did have uh, before the other speakers uh, actually spoke. But I just felt I had to comment on them. Um, I'm looking at page 77. Um, it's under uh, vehicle replacement program and elect electric electrification of the fleet. We're talking 11 million pounds worth of vehicles here. <coughs> That's a lot of money. And I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to ask the question, how much have we already spent on uh, replacing the, the council fleet and what's the end Result at uh, the end. Uh, how much is this actually going to cost us by uh, by the end of the day? Thanks, Robert. Okay, uh, Mr. Ben. 
Uh, thank you, Provis. I don't have uh, information today on the total investment that's gone into the vehicle replacement. Um, I, I'd also seek clarification if we're talking about the vehicle replacement fund per se, because that would have been going on ever since the council became uh, a council, or whether it's specifically to do with the electrified uh, vehicles. Yeah, I'm aware of that, um, uh, Mr. Benny, you know, because as you say, you know, it's um, vehicle replacement and then separate to that is the elect electrification of the fleet. Two different uh, two different sums there, eight million quid in one and three million quid in the other. That gives me the, the, the total of the, the 11 million pounds. However, if you go to, that's from page 77, if you go to page 83, uh, you'll actually see that uh, 5.3.19, this division uh, includes the vehicle replacement programme of 18.5 million. I'm assuming that that's just a clerical error. Is that right? Ms. Templeman? Sorry, could you show no, me? It's, it's fine. Uh, um, again. Uh, Amanda, uh, 5.3.19, uh, this division includes the vehicle replacement programme of 18.5. I'm assuming that that uh, should be actually 8.5. <laughs> Yes, I think Actually, that was right, okay, correct. Okay. Sorry. Now, even, even that, there's a wee bit of a dubiety about that because uh, on page 77, it tells me the vehicle replacement programme is £8 million. Pounds, and when I turn over half a dozen pages later, it's actually increased to £8.5 million. Pounds. So we've gained £0.5 million. Pounds. I hate accounts. Uh, Amanda, as you well know. Uh, thank you. I, I would have to go and have a look. I, I suspect there's probably been a rounding issue yeah, where we've, we've kind of rounded to the nearest million in one page, but to the to the first point okay. another. No, that's, that's fine, Amanda. Thanks. I'm, I'm just trying to point out, you know, the, the the absolute expense that we have to incur as um, as a council on. I mean, we're, we're talking about the uh, the iPad, you know, the connecting Falkirk. Um, uh, it's only four million pounds, and here we're spending circa uh, eleven million pounds on vehicle, and how long that's been uh, ongoing. Uh, if I can then turn to page eighty one, uh, Denny Eastern Access Road. Um, I noticed that it's um, the program has slipped uh, a month from. Even what's on the report, it's due to complete in May 24. Uh, but we just heard from Councillor Garner, it's not due to complete until June 24. Um, I'm just wondering, have we got any contingency funds available for any, any uh, potential problems with the, the new road? The reason I asked the question, I became aware of additional works to the Den Eastern Access Road, namely uh, the appearance of what appeared to be a big suds pond, which had not been detailed in any drawings of the Den Eastern Access Road uh, beforehand. I contacted uh, our officers and very kindly got an updated um, set of drawings for the Den Eastern Access Road, but they don't actually indicate the um, this huge big suds pond by the side of the existing road. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, do we have any... Um, contingency funds sitting available should we uh, go on a budget overrun because I would imagine that's a substantial increase to the original budget. Okay. Would you like an answer to that just now? It's fine. I mean, if uh, somebody wants to come back uh, uh, later on, I'm, I'm more than happy. Uh, yeah, what about Mr Kettrick just now? Okay, yeah. fine. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, built within the with all our, our construction contracts, including for roads, we do include a, a contingency risk element. Um, and just to clarify the, the completion date, it straddles the end of May and early June. Um, the, the carriageway will be open for, from early June, but the works predominantly will be finished on site at the end of May. Um, so that's the that, that's maybe clarify that that slight confusion. In terms of the SUDS works, these have been undertaken um, following obviously considerations on site of the ground conditions that have been done as, as, as we've had further investigations ongoing. There is currently no projected budget overruns within the project. Thank you, thanks very much for that answer. Very, uh, very concise. Very diplomatic, I must say, as well, between May and June. Like, um, again, staying local to my ward, um, well, 
saying that Falkirk to Denny Footpath, £1.4 million. Uh, I don't know if Paul, Malcolm, if you could maybe get me a drawing to identify. What, I've heard about this Denny Falkirk uh, Footpath footway, and I've never seen any drawings for it at all. Um, if I could just maybe get a copy of a drawing for that. I don't know where it's... I could certainly it. forward them on. I've got them published. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Um, just a final uh, Daphne point. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that they uh, were talking about um, updating um, uh, analog. It's um, page 845325, um, CCTV analog to digital. I, I would have thought we'd have been rid of uh, old analog. Analog's nearly as old as I am. Um, I would have thought we would have already been had ever in the place. Just a daffy. Okay. Um, Thanks, Bob. Anybody like to, Mr. Ketra, would you like to answer that? I thought. Vaguely advised that a lot of the telecommunications in the country still use the BT system, uh, the traditional lines, and they're analog by nature. Um, and there is a programme going across all local authorities as the lines are taken away for things like alarms, CCTV, to transfer them onto the digital format. Thanks very much, Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, th thanks very much. Uh, so we'll now go to Sinclair and then go to Bows. Thanks, Provost. Um, I suppose I just wanted to, to touch on the, the digital and connected learning within the schools and, and the impact that it has on the lives and opportunities of young folk. Because uh, I think it's been mentioned by several uh, several other members, and, and I thought it, it would be it would be good to add uh, to add our voice to this. To my knowledge, and I think coming back directly to, to, to some of the comments that were made earlier on, to my knowledge, Falkirk Council decided in 2019 that digital learning was a priority for the district. So thankfully from those decisions, Connected Falkirk was agreed upon in advance of the pandemic and the lockdowns that it subsequently brought about. Now, we all know the impact that that had on our children and young people, but without Connected Falkirk, I've got absolutely no doubt that this impact may have been greater. And so I suppose from a political standpoint, the pledge that was made of £350 million of funding to support digital learning came during the 2021 parliamentary election. So that's some two years after Falkirk Council made that decision. Uh, but it recognised the value in digital learning and the significant positive impact it can have across Scotland. So once again, we're seeing that Falkirk has been ahead of the curve in innovating for the benefit of children and young people in the district. Uh, as Mrs Templeman's already alluded to in the debate uh, in answer to some of the questions, we are willing and prepared to be at the table with the Scottish Government over the delivery of these policies. Uh, as I believe, uh, and we certainly believe, that Falkirk's story is incredibly positive, which has been recognised both by HMIE and the Scottish Government. Uh, the equity that devices bring across our estate is one as aspect of that positivity, but the improvement of shared learning opportunities and a sustained curriculum, as well as connection to education when people are not perhaps at school, are worth noting as well. Um, so Scottish Government aside, I believe that it's entirely appropriate for, the, for, for this council, us collectively, to plan and take action to improve those opportunities with the funding that we have and that we continue to be at the table when funding is available. Thank you. In the absence of the Provost can bring in Councillor Bass, please. Thank you. Um, First of all, um, can I just say that I really, really, and I know it's been covered by a couple, um, some other contributions, I, I, I'm questioning whether they're actually welcome, uh, 22.1 million e e extra spend um, here. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that I welcome it strongly, and whether it's been spent on iPads, whether it's been spent on roads, um, whether it's been spent on the gallery works, which I'm sure, given the raining today, we, we, we'll all see, uh, hopefully, in the future, a better result from that. Um, can, can I just put a little bit of statement of fact there? Um, so, the Council Tax was established in 1993 as a result of the Local Government Finance Act 1992, which was passed in Westminster. That introduced it to Scotland, Wales and England. The decisions, and, and I'm not being critical of them here, the decisions of the councillors at that time in the Falkirk area was to try to keep a low council tax. I understand that. They're trying to protect the people. 
that that then gives us, and Mr. Benny has already said, a, a problem in in the long term in financing it. It wasn't until two thousand and seven the the SNP comes to government in the in Scotland, and yes, there was ten ten council tax freezes. The the reasoning behind them was good for the people, and especially in a time which was an austerity period. Uh, do remember, if I remember rightly, the Chancellor that took over in 2010 was left a, left a note saying there is no money left. And so we entered a period of austerity. So for the right reasons, people made the decision not to harm the people. What the people who did it at first to set it so low and what, what council tax freezes for that 10-year that period did was but it was an unintended consequence. And it's a consequence which, which because we kept it so low initially, and then because of the problems with austerity and is having other council tax freezes, we, we get to a situation with which we are in today. Um, I think that the, this um, a capital budget allows us, as has been said, to put a good investment back to the people and um, so people can actually see see things see things happening. I don't blame people from the past, but from where we are, we need to deal where we are today. Um, and hopefully that can take take that uh, promise as a positive comment on 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 how we got here and more importantly a positive comment and welcoming um, this additional investment uh, compared to where we were last month. Yeah, thank, thanks very much Councillor Bowes. Um, we'll look and we'll look at Councillor Murta, would you like to ask your questions first before you speak to your amendment? I would, promise. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd just like to <clears throat> excuse me, echo the thanks that are, were given to the finance officers and to everyone involved in preparing these reports. But I especially want to thank um, Mr Moody, who sometimes is left out of these, um, these thank you um, expressions and who I'm afraid I am going to fire more questions at um, here. Um, but I think it's important to know that our whole process in getting any of these reports would just simply grind to a halt. Um, and I'm personally very grateful for, for the generosity of the time and the calm advice that he provides to get everything to these meetings. And, and I just want to record my thanks uh, on that. Um, thank you. Um, so, and this, apologies, this does feel um, like a little bit of history repeating, but essentially what I had originally wished to develop as an amendment was to revisit some of the savings we'd agreed in the revenue budget on the 28th of February, but the options in the report at 5.2.5, they effectively indicate that that isn't possible because of the revenue budget already uh, being balanced. So I'd just like some clarity from officers about that and uh, just to give some context. So my proposal would have been to take out the saving of the £600,000 um, for children and family social work, um, which was summarised in the EPI provision as a high risk. And that given that that would be my first choice for an amendment would be to look at the additional money which has now been confirmed by government and bring that into the revenue budget considerations to overturn that decision. Can Mr Moody or, or Mr Templeman explain why that isn't possible given that this in my view is new information? That's my question. Okay Mr Moody. Yes thank you Provost and the same consideration applies as to the earlier discussion that this was a decision already made by council. The six months rule applies, so the question arises, is there a material change of circumstances? So the issue is, does the confirmation of the £1.77 million pounds constitute such a material change? In my view, it doesn't. And the reason for saying that is that there's clear information in the reports before council in relation to making the budget decision that there was um, an anticipation of further funding from the Scottish Government. So the 1.77 million um, was um, referred to in those reports and in fact it has been confirmed as being available. And I think significantly for me, no more than the 1.77 million than had been referred to in the reports that were before council. So uh, on that basis, in my view, there was no material change. Thank you. Councillor Murta. Yeah, and I have to say that while I do understand and even more so respect 
that view that's being offered there. Um, I find it the present situation confusing uh, because right now councils um, who had access to those same forecasted additional amounts in their reports um, are now going back and revisiting their budget decisions, even to the extent of reversing their council tax. Um, and I think it's probably a reasonable point since I'm probably not the only one right now who's sort of at risk of waking up in the middle of the night shouting six month rule um, that we perhaps look um, at what could be a clearer set of guidelines and advice about what is new information and how it applies to decision making. Um, because for me, it is a really regrettable situation that we have, as far as I'm concerned, unallocated monies in the budget available in the revenue budget. But we can't go back and reverse something which is rated high risk to some of our more vulnerable residents. And I just want to quote from the EPA here to, to illustrate that, that the reduction of these services in children and families will in turn reduce the work being done to support the health and well-being of children, young people and their families who will benefit from this intervention, from that money. So that's the basis I would have prepared um, an, an amendment to begin with. And I just wanted to make that clear before going on to move my amendment. <clears throat> so. As I say, it's more of an addendum and, and I would hope that it could sit alongside the officer's recommendations um, which have been moved by the administration. It's not intended to replace. Um, so I'm, I just to be clear, I'm, I have finished my questions. I'm just moving into moving my okay, addendum. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so uh, similarly put, the, the Grange Mental Protection Scheme has and, and will be an enormous undertaking for council and one I do hope that will bring great benefit to the entire district but most especially to those who live and work within the scheme boundaries and some of which are in my own ward and while admittedly um, having money ring fenced for its development um, it has naturally drawn focus and attention away from other potential flooding projects even just by virtue of the time needed by officers to develop strategy and papers which appear here at committee um, essentially, however, the devotion and prioritisation of expert staff resource to the project has had an impact on available expertise to progress wider flooding matters. And I'm very aware of the problems that the department has had in the recruitment and retention of flooding officers. So naturally having a ward that even has the word cars in the title, and I think being on my fifth pair of wellies since I started as a councillor, Flooding is something which I spend a great deal of time progressing with officers because of the real impact and concern felt within my communities uh, and not least by those who have been personally hit. Incidentally, the scene behind me doesn't always look like that. It just increasingly does with the flooding that we get. And ironically, when I was finally finalising the text of this amendment, I had to interrupt drafting to go and meet with a local farmer who is now encountering flooding in fields which have never been experienced this before, despite the farm being in his family for three generations. And over the past seven years, it's been regularly raised as a top concern from residents in Lethem, Earth, Dunmore, South Alloa and both Kenner, as well as those who border the area along the Carron further inland. And that's without looking at additional surface water and drainage concerns that are common across all areas, I expect. It's partly why I felt the to this paper was absolutely necessary because some of the projects outlined in the original Appendix 2 of the Capital Report, such as the projects at Dunmore and Lethem, are important that residents have surety about delivery on. And I'm sure that other members feel similarly about those in their own wards. But this was not something that I was prepared to leave to chance or not have an opportunity to move something on, which ensured they would be included in this year's capital programme. And I do welcome that the underspend monies won't be ring fenced for flooding purposes. But it was important to have that information before making decisions on the overall programme. And I'm pleased that this has enabled a proposal to assist with the gap of the Connect to Falkirk project, which others have spoken about. In part, though, I feel that these monies being originally for flooding and in reflection of the impact that the Grangemouth Flood Protection Scheme has had on other areas, there should be a commitment given now by Council to look at ways in which we can bring focus and priority to the wider flooding issues. And I've already had various discussions with Amanda, Colin and officers in place about how funding could be allocated for the work that might take place in this regard. But the barriers in terms of financial regulations by not being able to use capital for feasibility studies or staff resource, for example, mean it's really challenging at this time to allocate a portion of the capital monies available to be decided on now that have come about from this. So the last two clauses in my amendment really look to address that in bringing forward proposals 
uh, within a report that could consider the creation of an overarching project that looks at wider flooding issues, be that fluvial, coastal management or other general flooding concerns, and could have the ability in future to widen the funding streams available to progress these matters. I've discussed this with officers in place and I genuinely believe that this should assist rather than hinder the progress of current work streams, but which crucially provides a focus and an opportunity to demonstrate our commitment to our communities on tackling this important issue. And I've noted also that the revenue budget motion passed on the 20th of February included an amount within future service concession spend that was described to the Connected Falkirk project. And given that this is now proposed to be funded directly from the Range Mary Flood Protection Scheme underspend and will be removed from that list, I think it's only fair and logical that future flooding projects should also have the ability to bid into service concession fund also. Well, it wouldn't be my preferred approach to fund such projects. I accept that the motion agreed by council, um, that th agreed by council, approved us as part of a future strategy. And since we've already established uh, ad nauseum, probably that we can't revisit those decisions at this time, I'm simply trying to ensure that there is the widest possible application of opportunity to fund essential projects within the framework of that discussion. I'd be grateful for the support of all members on this. And I'm happy to ask que answer questions. Um, on that, but I would hope that this, as a priority for us all, it's not intended to be controversial and could gather support across the chain. Chamber. Thank you, Provost. Thanks very much, Councillor Murphy. Do you have a seconder for your amendment? Yeah, my right, we see, do we have a physical copy of... Um, uh, yeah, we're just going to circulate it, Councillor McKay. Thanks, thanks Provost. So, do, do you have a seconder? Yeah, I do. Pro, 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 I, I would be happy um, to incorporate the addendum within the motion. Okay. Okay. Provost, I'd, I'd be very happy if that was the case. Okay. So did everyone hear that? The uh, councillor Mickey Jones happy to accept the addendum into the motion. Okay. With your permission, Robert, uh, I thanks to councillor Mickey John for um, expressing that, and um, that's very welcome. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Hey, thanks very much, councillor Murta. Provost. Yes, Councillor yes, Murta. Sorry, it's just um, and there's no there's no sound coming from the room, so there's a few messages going around between the members online that just wondering whether that so there is somebody speaking or not because all we're hearing is is nothing. Well, no, everybody was engrossed in your amendment. That's. I see. I didn't realise yes, that. Oh, that's okay. what it is. I could narrate it if you prefer. No, it's okay. Just to. Uh,
Yes. So uh, we've got Mr. Moody to sort of summarise where we are. Thank you, Provost. And we have the motion moved and amend, moved and seconded. And Councillor Marta has moved her amendment. The Leader of the Council has indicated that she will incorporate um, the terms of the addendum within her motion. And accordingly, there's now no amendment before the Council. So I think fundamentally the question will be whether the Council is in agreement with the motion as adjusted to incorporate the amendment. I think Provost, it would be also be appropriate to ask the Leader of the Council if she wishes to to sum up or not before we put the question of whether the Council is agreed. OK, so would you like to summarise, Councillor Nicodron? Uh, just very briefly, a few um, comments. Um, I appreciate, um, firstly, that um, neither Mr Benny or Mr Kertig was here when the place-based funding, the 800000 for New Market Street, came about. Um, that was funding that we would not have had for anything else other than town centre regeneration um, at that time. And that has been made clear on a number of occasions, including to um, general public and press releases, etc. Um, so, and, and that there are other aspects of funding um, there that could only be used at, for specific purposes. Um, uh, there's been comments about our, our, our low council tax. Um, our low council tax was before, that was the case before the council tax freeze was initially introduced and, and it's therefore it's a legacy um, that we've been left with along the low fees and charges. But as um, Mr uh, uh, Laurie has said, uh, the council has been somewhat behind the curve and not wishing to take some difficult decisions in the past. Um, particularly around the SPR and that has delayed the progress around our asset management and has left us with some real challenges before us um, now and it's up to us to know how we now look to address that um, in, in the longer term. Um, funding will always be an issue and to be honest um, you know, local government, um, it doesn't matter how much money you give local government, we're always able to spend it um, because as, as our communities that we um, seek to fund the most um, capital funding will continue to be pressured um, not just um, for us but for the, the Scottish government with the allocations um, coming from, from Westminster and I think that's something that has to be acknowledged and um, that if there's lobbying to be done um, while we can lobby the Scottish Government, it's really important that we also lobby, lobby the UK Government, as Councillor Bundy has indicated, particularly around um, the Green Flood Protection Scheme, because without that national um, overview, um, that, that the, the project, particularly around the industries, is, is going to be of the magnitude that the Falkirk Council um, cannot manage alone at, or indeed um, Scottish Government. But we do have a, a capital programme before us um, that, um, as I said in my speech, will not be enough. I, I recognise that and we have to look to how we can maximise that. But what we do need to have, do is have a plan in place uh, and, and be able to allow um, the, um, the, the various aspects that are more important. Uh, that they're a real priority to rise to the top and officers will help doing that in, in developing the programme. In relation to, to Councillor Murta's uh, amendment, um, I think it is um, probably a, a, a good way forward of doing exactly that future planning um, by bringing forward a programme um, of the hotspots that are um, you know, flooding hotspots and be able to prioritise that, that will of course have to be um, reviewed as part of the capital bidding programme and go into that priority status. It would then be up to, to elected members um, to identify or, um, where that, that funding would go for, from in the future. Um, but I think it um, puts us in a better place to know the challenges before us, and that includes the challenges around our learning estate um, so that we can make informed decisions. Um, so I, I hope that we are now able to get consensus around our capital programme and allow these programmes to move forward at pace. Thank you, Provost. Yes, thanks very much, Councillor Michael John. So we have a, a motion moved and seconded, and uh, Councillor Murta's addendum has been incorporated into that motion. Um, there are no, no other amendments, and we've had a reasonable debate. So are we agreed? Okay, thank you, and we'll have a 10 minute comfort break. Thank you.
Okay, welcome. Actually, one next item of business agenda item six standing orders review update. Uh, it's a report by the Director of Transformation Communities and Corporate Services, pages 111 to 140 on your agenda papers. And Mr. Moody will summarise the report. Yes, thank you, Provost. And this report follows on from the detailed consideration which members gave to the outcome of the review of standing orders at your December meeting. This is the first of two follow up reports. It had originally been intended to uh, roll this up in one report, but I think on looking at the matter more closely, it just required two, because as a matter of logic, to allow you to agree some of the earlier aspects in this report before we come back with the detailed uh, redrafted standing orders in June of this year. So this report deals with four aspects uh, which were raised within the standing orders review and your discussion of it in December. The first relates to the new committee structure. And if members recall, it was agreed that the two executives would be merged and the two scrutiny committees would be merged, but they would be increased in size to 15, which would allow all members of the council a role in either of those two committees. But the consequence of increasing the size is it's necessary to look again at the uh, political balance of the new committees and this report uh, suggests the um, proposed balance on both the executive and the scrutiny committee. It, it reflects the agreement of council to the proposal from the standing orders working group that in relation to the executive, the administration benefits from rounding up, but in relation to the scrutiny where that issue arises, it happens the other way around and there would be a rounding down for the administration and that's what's reflected in the um, report before you. The second item we have is the new programme for meetings for after the recess, again taking into account considerations which we discussed in December and in particular moving the decision making meetings to later in the week and that is to allow for the new system which will come into force of prior circulation of motion and amendments and allow that to happen after uh, group meetings. So the detailed uh, programme of meetings is appended uh, to your um, report. And one other factor I would also refer to is we have attempted uh, to avoid uh, school holidays. So if it does look as if some meetings are crushed up against each other, that's part of the um, the reason behind that. Third issue is in relation to substitutes. And this was a particular remit given at the council meeting in December to consider a process uh, for substitute for members. So the outline of such a proposal is contained within uh, paragraphs 5.6 and 5.7 of the report. And what's proposed is a system of substitution that would apply to the executive and to the scrutiny committee. It's largely one that will be managed where members are members of a group by the group leader. So it will be for the group leader to name the substitute if uh, the member is unable to attend either the executive or the scrutiny committee. And it's intended to apply in exceptional cases such as illness or bereavement or where caring responsibilities don't allow uh, for the member to uh, participate in the meeting. In relation to members who are not part of a group, that will largely be a matter of self-management. They will need to take that view themselves and it will be for them to nominate uh, who a substitute would be. The reason it applies only to the Executive and Scrutiny Committee is, I think, looking at the other committees, such as the Appeal Committee, the Civic Licensing Committee or the Planning Committee, all of those have training 
requirements and specialist knowledge is built up in relation to the decision making, which would make it not suitable for a system of general substitution if a member was not available. So that's the broad outline of the proposal that's before you. And if agreed, that will be reflected in the detailed standing orders coming forward in June. You also agreed as a council in December uh, that there should be a proposal brought forward in relation to uh, dealing with petitions. And this uh, outlines from paragraph 5.9 onwards uh, the proposals in relation to that. I won't say more on the detail of that just now, but I'm happy to uh, attempt to deal with any questions that members have to to raise on it. But broadly, it's reflective of what was proposed within the uh, Standing Orders Working Group. This isn't in the place. The, it's maybe important to add that the process for deputations will still be available for items which are on a council or committee agenda. This relates to items which are not on a council agenda. Other than that, I promise that I draw members' attention to the recommendations, which are at paragraph two of the report. And again, as I said, I'll attempt to deal with questions from members. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Moody. I'll now go to Councillor Mitchell to speak to you. If you thank, thank, thank you, Provost. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to fight my, my way over the, the sound of the rain. Reminds me very much of sitting in a, a caravan site at the moment, <laughs> the rain battering down. Um, but um, I'm not going to say too much um, other than thank um, Mr Moody and um, Mr Perry for the, the work that they've done um, in, in, in developing this. And um, I fully appreciate that there's some decisions that needed to be clarified before we could go to um, the, the, the actual changes to the standing orders. Um, there was a, a great deal of, of uh, acknowledgement and consensus when group leaders met to, to go through the, the discussion process, um, which I think was, was helpful. And um, having already taken some of the decisions around the sizes of the, the, the executive and the scrutiny, um, I, I would want to propose, as per the recommendations, the makeup um, of, of the, the, the two committees, um, as, as um, suggested in the report. Um, I also um, would thank um, cognizance of the school holidays in, in setting out the programme of meetings and hope that um, by moving the executives um, and the scrutinies to monthly meetings that will enable members to be able to plan better ahead um, and have a more regular cycle um, for, for meetings going forward. This year in substitutes has always been um, a, a bit of a, a, a challenge, but I think um, having reached the, the, the um, recommendations that you have by having that for um, only the executive and the scrutiny, um, notwithstanding um, the clarification that in this case you can have someone from the, the scrutiny sit on the executive and the opposite way round by case of a substitution um, and appreciate the management should be with the individual groups um, to be able to do that. And finally, the process um, for dealing with petitions. We've spoke a, a long and weary about a petitions committee, but um, we, as we have a, a committee structure there, um, having a process to deal with petitions that come in, um, I think it is reasonable. And um, I think the, the level of, of signatures required reflects a, a proportionality um, in comparison to um, what happens at um, further spheres such as the Scottish Government. Um, and is, it gives a, a reasonable representation from communities um, to be able to take that forward. So on that, um, Provost, I'm happy to move the recommendations as in the report. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Michael John. Do you have a second? Happy to say, Provost. Thanks very much, Councillor Garner. I'll now go to Councillor Hannah to see if you've got an amendment or you'd like to say up I here. have no amendment, but I have some questions. OK. Um, Councillor Bailey-Kerr, do you have an amendment? No amendment, but a couple of questions, Provost. Okay. Councillor Spears, do you have an amendment? I don't have an amendment, but I have uh, questions and recommendations. OK, thank you. Um, does any of the independents have an amendment? Ditto no. what the other speakers said. I have some questions. OK, thank you. So, OK. So we'll go to Councillor Hall. Uh, thank you, Provost, and thank you to um, 
Mr Moody and Mr Perry for bringing this forward. Um, it's an incredibly complicated business making it making amendments to the standing orders and I, I fully I fully uh, accept that, that they've, they've worked very hard on this. I um, wanted to ask a bit of question, a little more clarification about the petitions procedure. I think we all would welcome a petitions procedure to enable our constituents to have a say on, in terms of things that matter to them. Clearly, it's important. But I wonder if you could say a little more about um, on what basis the chief governance officer will determine whether a petition is valid. Um, because... That there has, I would have thought we need some clarification around that question of the validity of a petition. Uh, yes, it says earlier on that it would have to be something that's within the power of the local authority, but how does it interact with other parts of the standing orders, for example, changing material circumstances and all these other issues? Yes, thank, you, thank you, Provost. I think the, the first um, issue is really, as identified by Councillor Hanna, is it a matter that's within a relevant issue for the Council? So that will be the first issue to identify. And I think the point that uh, Councillor Hanna is maybe alluding to is, is this a way in which uh, petitioners could use the petition procedure potentially as a back door? Um, through the six months rule? I think the answer to that is no. The mere fact that there is a petition on an issue would not empower a committee to take a, a, any decision which was contrary to the, the six months rule. I think it's maybe helpful to say that partly I think how this is envisaged is this is an opportunity for communities to draw an issue to the attention of councillors and to draw the strength of feeling within a community about an issue to councillors in the form of a, a committee. But it's not there, I think, at the point at which that petition is presented for the committee to immediately be taking a decision which will um, determine the matter. I think it will be more a matter of the committee may call for further information, may need more information before they need before they were able to take any decision at all to address, if at all, the issue which has been raised by the, the communities through the petition process. And that's reflective, for instance, I think, in the, the petitions committee process in the Scottish Parliament, where it allows people to have the issue discussed, but it doesn't have the next stage uh, with it to change the legislation that people may be drawing attention to that's an issue which is dealt with at a later stage. If I could just ask a, a supplementary there. So um, would there be circumstances where, for example, a petition came before the council and in support of that petition, a member would put forward a motion or would there never be a motion following on from a petition? I think is the important distinction. Mm, Mr Moody. I think there would not be a motion which would be determinative of the issue which is being raised. So, I mean, if we take an example and uh, try and pick one that's not current or controversial of people within a community say there are insufficient play facilities in this area, we hear it, receive a petition which says that that is the case. I think if members on a committee are hearing that and say, well, perhaps there is something in that, they would call for a final report of what's the general plan for the allocation of play facilities, what's the available budget, where does this community fit into that? So I think it's that kind of iterative process of moving towards decision making rather than the matter being presented to say X must happen and a motion being moved that it happens on the day. I think that's a helpful point to raise, though, and something which I think will emerge in the detailed standing order provision in relation to it. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. We'll now go to Bailey Kia. Thank you, Thomas. A uh, couple of questions. One on uh, uh, 
Thanks for Nico Jordan already asked the question that I was going to ask regarding the substitutes for the executive and scrutiny. I don't know if I agree with that. Because uh, if you're on one, could you influence the other one? I think there's maybe two answers to that, Provost. One is that the size of the committees of necessity mean that if you're not able to go to an executive, it needs to be someone from the scrutiny membership who will substitute for that person. I think the intention is that this is an exceptional circumstance. So it's expected to be managed by the group leaders in that way. The person will not become a member of that body on a permanent basis. It really is to preserve um, the political and proportional balance at these meetings, and it should be for that meeting only where the member is uh, not available to attend. Okay. But other question is regarding the committees that you mentioned where training had to be uh, done. What if somebody's already been on the committee and came off and has a training, will they be allowed to go as a substitute then? As the proposal stands, no. It's, it's reserved for the for the uh, scrutiny and the executive only. I think the other observation I would make about those committees is although they're proportionate to the political balance on the council, the decisions are not political. No. So it should not make the same kind of difference as it would, for instance, at an executive meeting where we can all see from the numbers, the numbers are finally balanced across the council. So substitution has um, more of a justification, I think, in that circumstance than it would do in one of the regulatory committees. OK, thank you. Uh, my last question is with regards to the petitions. And that's one, two, three, four. The fifth bullet point in 177, where the published procedure was set on a basis on which pet petitions will not be accepted for example, they contain defamatory or offensive statements. Who determines an offensive statement? People are people not going to be allowed an opinion or? I think as, as the procedure is set out at the moment, um, maybe happily or unhappily, that falls to me to decide whether it's offensive or not. I think... Um, I understand that people have strong views if they're going to have gone to the, the, the step of lodging a petition with the council, it might be on strong terms. I understand the difference between a strong opinion and an offensive uh, way of, of putting it. There may be grey areas in some of those. We'll learn, I think, as we go along um, how it's applied. Right, okay, okay. It just it, it leads on. It leads on for what I was. The initiative by Scottish government, you know, the police service in Scotland regarding the new hate monster. If we determine it's no defamatory or offensive. Will they be able to put a complaint in? Think about, um, Thank you. Well, I think uh, Billy Kerr is referring to the initiative that was promoted by Scotland in relation to hate crime. I think if there was something in uh, a petition which someone thought was 
constituted a hate crime, it would always be open to someone to make that complaint to Police Scotland. I think in part the provision in relation to defamatory or offensive is aimed to avoid that kind of situation coming about. I'm maybe over optimistic in my view of this, but I don't anticipate that's the kind of issue that communities will be bringing forward. I think these are going to be community concerns about the provision of services. Again, I think we'll learn and we'll see as we go along. Thanks, Colin. And you just mentioned communities. Is it only communities that can bring it forward or 50 individual different people for different areas? Yes, it could be 50, 50 individuals, but I think if people are going to coalesce sufficiently to have 50 signatures, it's more likely to be a local community or it could be a community of interest. Right, okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bailey Kerr. We're going to go to Councillor Spears. Thank you. This is called a statutory, um, so the standing orders review. Can I tell, can I ask then uh, what review has been done into independent members being present at group leaders meetings uh, and the financial uh, strategy group and the leaders group? Okay, I'm still ready. I think it may be helpful to start with the observation that independent members were uh, represented on the Standing Orders Working Group um, very constructively and helpfully by your colleague, Councillor McCabe. The, at present, there's nothing in the Standing Orders Review in relation to that particular issue, which is raised about group uh, leaders' attendance uh, at meetings or indeed at uh, the financial strategy group. So nothing was recommended in the review in relation to that. Well, can I interject then? Um, since standing orders are to maintain the democracy um, for elected members who are all elected equally at an election every few years in this district, we are not present for the example that the leaders group which decided what will come up at a full council meeting. We're not there to decide if somebody brings forward a motion, if that motion can come forward. On the financial strategy group, we're kept in the dark until it's posted out to us, but we have no input in that group. Now, as the third largest group in this council, I think we need to go back to square one and check where we stand democratically within these two committees, especially. Okay, Mr. Moody. I think, first of all, the decision on whether the motion is stands referred or is remains at council is not made at the leader made by the leaders group. The decision is made by the provost, having consulted with the leaders of the main groups. The financial strategy group. Uh, isn't a body established within the standing orders. It's established by separate council decision. Um, so it wouldn't be covered by uh, this particular standing orders review. You put it on, please. That, that's why I mentioned the word recommendation. Maybe it should be looked at the group. If the provost in consultation with two or three group leaders one which is the fourth biggest party but omits the third biggest grouping then we need to seriously look at that i think the general public would agree that when they go out and vote independent they want them to have a voice okay thanks councillor spears we'll go to councillor martin oh, the point just a point of information that one okay are, are the independents actually a group i thought there were six independent individual councillors with two being members of the non-aligned independent group. Maybe just clarify that, Mr Moody. As I understand the position, there are two members of the non-aligned independent group, as Councillor Garner indicates, the four other independent members are not members of a group. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Murtagh, then Councillor Binney. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd confirm that that is also my understanding of the case as it stands at the moment. Um, I think that in general terms, um, in terms of standing orders review, because there's been quite a few standing order reviews over the last seven years, and one of the things, um, this, these are very specific parts in these recommendations to, to that have already, you know, partly been looked at as the drafting instructions back in December, and the final review, um, as it's, it's laid out, is to come back to full council. And I suppose, I mean, I've already stated in the past that, you know, I, I think there are things which do need to be re-looked at and revisited. Um, and I wanted to ask Mr Moody about, in the past, what happened in some ways was we reviewed standing orders, we voted on standing orders a block, and that was standing orders. And then you couldn't bring back changes to standing orders within six months because it was kind of like a whole package. But the approach we seem to be taking just now is that we're agreeing these recommendations for very good practical reasons. And then the final, the paper with the rest of the recommendations would come forward um, in June, but for very specific things. So it would potentially still be open to members in future, September, December, full council, to look at some of those other um, standing orders if there were particular things that they wanted to bring forward a motion on. Would that be correct? Mr Moody. I think I would need to know exactly what the proposal was, what the timing was in relation to decisions already made. But yes, in yeah. principle, um, you, the word you used is potentially, so I won't say not potentially. Um, the, but I'll reserve my position until I see what it is that's being proposed. Okay, perhaps, perhaps in some ways as well, because quite helpfully, the full council that we have is at the end of June and the full council that we had to do these draft instructions was at the beginning of December. So um, my maths makes that more than six months anyway. So if, if, for example, we did wish to revisit something in principle on one of the standing orders that was being presented, we would have the ability to do that at the end of June anyway. And perhaps if there were other things which had been omitted from the original review, um, by, by virtue of the fact that standing orders were being amended, potentially councillors could therefore maybe bring things forward at that meeting. Would that be the case? I'll agree with the word potentially again, Provost. <laughs> I'm not going to go back on my previous thanks to Colin because he has given me much time over the last few hours. Um, so I just I do want to pick up though on a point about equalities. Um, in, in the report and I know that there is the EPIA that has been attached um, into, and it's looked specifically about the issue of the meeting times so you know the 10 o'clock start um, and I suppose I was a bit disappointed that there wasn't a wider EPIA on this um, because I think that there, there are other examples of just even in this particular proposal to put the uh, the calendar to agree the calendar where we need to be mindful that, that there are equalities impacts and it's not just about um, those with caring responsibilities either. Um, and I just wanted to remind Council um, about a decision that was made in December 2021 on the subject of towards a diverse and inclusive Council. And the final two points of this were to give due regard to all protected characteristics outlined in the Equality Act and the needs of underrepresented groups when arranging meeting events and locations and times and reviewing available options for attendance to meet a variety of needs and to communicate these measures and embody this ethos to the general public in order to instill confidence in the council as an organisation that all sections of society are welcome equally within. And that last part was about all the things agreed in the motion. Um, so in fairness, I think if, if we're given that we're going to change the meeting days, uh, you know, partway through a year, perhaps the EPIA and the discussions in general might have reflected better the impact on those who have no choice but to work. And while I don't have an amendment, I want to highlight that any decision on this will mean that those members who have um, arranged their shift patterns with employers and colleagues and made agreements with job share partners and the like, and who booked their holidays in advance for the whole year, um, and their partners with their colleagues, they will be impacted by this decision. And that's the reason it's an issue for equality and poverty is that the hours which councillors work very often put us well under the national living wage. In the case, it's often the younger generations who are less likely to be councillors in the first place, but who don't have as secure and senior positions in their employment who struggle 
with juggling those responsibilities and staying in the role. And similarly, women are much more likely to be in part time, lower paid and insecure employment. And we know that that demographic are underrepresented in councils across the country also. So in consideration of that, in decisions like this and being open about this topic, it's important because we need to remember that our commitment to embodying the inclusive environment that removes barriers to preparation, to participation, and doesn't make it harder. We, we've committed to that. So, you know, I mean, for myself so far this year, I think all of my annual leave has been from work, has been, as was the case yesterday, to take extra time to attend and prepare for council meetings or to catch up on them because of, you know, the, the time. So, you know, that that does have an impact on that demographic. And I had a, a, a colleague who said earlier on the way to a council meeting earlier in the week to me that they hadn't been able to put their children to bed for seven straight days in a row because of attending council meetings and juggling work. So we do need to get better at reflecting that when we make these decisions um, about meeting that, you know, about meeting times, that it's that's why we have an EPIA. And I'm not I take the point that there was a focus group or, you know, where we weren't to call it. Um, and with the greatest of respect to everybody in that group, it doesn't represent the wideness of of all demographics and that's why we have EPIAs so that we can properly consider it um, and it's not just one subset of elected members uh, valuable I'm sure that their contributions were so I suppose I'm saying it's, it's not a case of top marks for not trying but it's a case that we definitely could do better in this case and this was an opportunity to, to demonstrate what we'd committed to so perhaps when we come to the next iteration we could think a little bit um, more deeply about it. Thank you, Provost. OK, thanks very much, Councillor Murta. We'll go to Councillor Burnley then, uh, Councillor Burnley. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I just want to say <clears throat> scrutiny has an important part to play within council business. I'm sure we'll all agree. It's about checks and balances for good governance. So the question is, with regard to substitutions, will the same focus and emphasising be given to the scrutiny committees, because in the past, the scrutiny committees, the likelihood was they didn't have as many members attending. So I would like, will this focus to substitute be of equal measure and give importance to both committees the same way? That's my question. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Mr. Moody. I think that's certainly the intention in the proposal, Provost. Um, if I think it can be seen from the report that the scrutiny committee is seen as an important balance to the executive. It's equal in size and the substitution process applies to those two committees equally. I mean, it will be largely a matter for the group leader in managing this in practice, but certainly that is the intention that there's an equality of treatment between the executive and the scrutiny committee. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor Bunny. We've got to Councillor Bundy. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, I just wanted to put on record um, that I'm quite uncomfortable of the idea with people who sit on the executive going on to scrutiny as a substitute if they have made a decision at executive. I think that's something that needs to be looked at and see how they take an impartial look at that issue if they have previously made a vote on it. Um, but I wanted to talk mostly about the petition process and because um, the Scottish Parliament's petition process has been referred to a couple of times and I'm actually currently using the petition process of the Scottish Parliament um, with the, sh the stroke campaign um, that my family are running. I think it's beneficial that the Scottish Parliament have a specific committee to look at petitions and the reason for that is they allow more evidence and more support to be given to the petitioner if they think the petition is of relevance before it goes to the committee in question. So, for example, with the petition that my family have put forward, the petition committee of the Scottish Parliament agreed to write to the Stroke Association, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland and the minister to understand where everyone was at before they decide what committee it goes to if they decide to take it to a committee. But I think that step is very helpful. One, it helps with the rewriting of a petition to make sure it's competent. 
and two, it means that a committee isn't seeing it and pushing it aside and then coming back to committee. I think if it's ready for the committee to see with the relevant information, it's just going to streamline the process and save time for everyone and particularly support the petitioner in question. So, really, thank you, Provost. I think those are, are very helpful comments. The I suppose the balancing act that the the working group had to do though was it was also keen to streamline our committee process. There was consideration given to should there be a separate petitions committee. I think the the answer on balance was there was a preference to have fewer committees rather than than more. And I suppose my reflection in part would be that the Scottish Parliament has the benefit of a much larger membership for populating committees and also the resources uh, to staff and support such committees too. But I think the the reflections on the, the role of the Petitions Committee in supporting petitioners are maybe a useful basis to build upon, um, which could be a part of a process uh, before the matter is presented to one of the, the Council Committees. So I'm grateful for those comments, Provost. Thanks very much, Mr. Moody. And I go to Councillor McCabe. Thank you, Provost. I'd just like, first of all, to place on record my thanks to, um, to Jim, Jack, Brian, and Colin for their work uh, within the Standing Orders Working Group. I um, found it very, very helpful and very uh, beneficial. Um, within that working group, we discussed a number of issues that uh, were put in front of us, brought in front of us, examples and, and discussed and debated it. And that's why we came up with a report, which eventually came to Council in um, December, I think. But out with that, there's stuff, it's like, um, it's like you're, a, you're an army officer with a plan. That plan of attack, as soon as you engage the enemy, the plan gets thrown out the window and whatever. So here we've had, uh, we've already heard uh, a couple of examples um, of concerns that I have, and Councillor Murta alluded to as well. That's things like, um, I've got concerns about the requisition of uh, special meetings um, and how that's handled through the standing orders process. And also the invoking of the six month rule and the interpretation of that. I think we need to drill down a wee bit more on uh, a, those couple of issues, but I do realise that's not within the paper in front of us today. So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy, you know, that um, what is in the paper today, I'm, uh, I'm rel relatively comfortable with. One of the things I'd just like to point out, and I'm grateful to Councillor Bundy just for clarifying it for me. I wasn't too sure when Councillor Kerr, I believe, uh, Billy Kerr, uh, when he asked uh, the question about, um, you know, uh, substitutes. I, I didn't, I was I was curious about it, but Councillor Bundy's uh, clarified it, I think. I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, somebody serving on either the scrutiny committee can then deputise to go on to the executive. However, short term that may be, I just don't think it's um I, I just don't think it's a feasible option, if you like, you know. Um but I realise, you know, that may come down to um group numbers and, and whatever uh, however that's handled. Um and just something that um my colleague Councillor Spears uh, alluded to it's to do with the issue of independence. Councillor Spears, uh, Councillor Spears and myself, we, we do form the, the non-aligned independence within the independent outcome group. But we've already had uh, some informal discussions between the uh, independents, all of the independents, because we do realise that it does pose a problem to um, the governance of the council. How do you engage with Basically, what is 20% of your council makeup if they're not involved in whether it's working groups or leaders groups or whatever? So it is an issue. I know that um, there is no single answer. You know, I mean, greatest respect to Mr. Moody, he can't answer it. And within the independence ourselves, we're even struggling to come up with a, a 
tangible solution, if you like. You know, we are looking to maybe. I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of, um, you know, the independence being recognised as independence, where we're going to have discussions with council officers. Is there some way that we can? be identified as that to allow you know um, discussions with officers to try and speed up the process but that's that's for further down the line i just thought i'd throw in those couple of observations provis but relatively happy with what's in the paper thank you yeah, thanks very much councillor mckay we've now got councillor nickel john do you want to sum up um just very very briefly um provis i hear what people are saying um particularly in relation to the substitutions um there there, there was a vote taken um on substitutions um and um I, i've got to say that personally i wasn't in favor of that um and having substitutes but um that was the decision of members and it's interesting to hear just some of the comments coming back now because those members are now had supported that um but um we, we have that a, a, a proposal in order to actually uh, take that forward i think it's the best way um we can do that um without compromising um other areas um i think that the initial decision around the um the, the change of date was given um, in December and as we're not looking to implement that until um, later this year, I think that that gave it quite a, a piece of notice for those that do have other employment to have those discussions around um, taking uh, time off with their employers uh, for their role as an elected member and perhaps um, readjusting their hours accordingly. So I think we have given as much notice as, as we can and there was a desire to do that in order to, to help the um, business of the council move more swiftly, recognising that um, a number of the groups meet on a Monday um, and with the executive being on a Tuesday, there, there was a tight turnaround um, there. So um, it was about actually trying to make the council work better and more effectively that that, that um, uh, decision was, was brought forward. But I think we, we have a, a process, and I recognise this isn't necessarily standing orders, this is a process that will inform the standing orders, um, and um, ultimately um, standing orders aren't forever, and are usually reviewed, um, certainly each um, new council, um, and there will be opportunities going forward um, to be able to, to, to do that if it is not uh, indeed working, but until we actually get into um, using um, a, a different format, we won't know how, how that is going to work. Um, and I think that that's an, a really important aspect um, that people need to remember. Um, it's, it's about how we function as a council um, and, and make the decisions of the council and um, being able to, to do that as effectively as we can. So I'm, I'm content with what we've got going forward, Provost. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll have the final word to Councillor Murta. Yeah, I apologise. I didn't. I don't know what the process was. So, so uh, my person. apologies. Sorry, sorry Councillor Mutter. Hey, Councillor Mickey John's already summed up. Okay, if um, I can come back to a point of clarification after things have summed up, just on general standing orders, that would might that might sort that. Is that a point of clarification? What what is it about? No, it's so it's just a point of clarification on how standing orders currently work, um, because. At the moment, as I understand it, the way that we appoint committees, so for example, when we come to appointments, agree proportionality and there's a slate provided for the various committees and the group group leaders or independents will say, these are our members who go to executive. It's within, there doesn't seem to be anything within standing orders that says that has to apply until the next committee cycle. And in effect, it seems to me that that technically members can be swapped in and out at, you know, at short notice anyway, and there's nothing which seems to prevent that. So in some ways, we already have a situation where, in effect, substitutes can be at short notice um, provided and then swapped back again, because there's nothing to prevent a slate, as far as I can see in standing orders, um, from being amended in between um, committees. It's not, it doesn't need to come back for approval to council. Is that, so maybe um, Mr Moody could clarify. Sure, yeah. Okay, is that your point of clarification? Yeah, okay. how it works. Mr. Moody? I think the answer is yes. In theory, a group could change its slate as often as it wanted to. In practice, that's not what happens, and there is a stable membership uh, within the committees. So that's the background. 
uh, against which the substitution proposal, which, as Councillor Mikudon has properly reflected, was a decision of council to, to ask us to bring this forward. So that's the background against which the proposal was made. OK, thank you. Um, we've got a uh, recommendation to be moved and seconded and there's no amendment, so are we agreed? OK, we'll break for lunch back here at 2 o'clock.
Business. Okay. Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, slight change to the order of business. Uh, we're going to take agenda item 10 next, which is uh, um, Christopher McCabe's motion. So one motion was submitted in accordance with standing order 29, set out below. This stands referred to the executive. However, having consulted with the main group leaders, I'm content that this matter should be dealt with by the council today. So we'll go to Councillor McCabe to speak to his motion. Thank you very much, Provost. Thanks, first of all, for agreeing to allow the motion to be heard rather than to be referred to the executive. I think it's quite important because it affects all councillors, not just uh, members on the executive. It's not a policy decision per se. And also thanks to, for bringing the item 10 forward. Uh, the fact that uh, Mrs. Ostachini is sitting in the background, I think it'd be, it's only courteous that, uh, you know, we take care of this matter uh, first. So, in reference to uh, my motion, you'll see that I've, I've got grave concerns about the, uh, the whole process of, of the thing, where we had already made a decision in the, at the meeting of the 7th of December 2023, and uh, in January 2024, that decision was overturned. Now, you recollect that I question whether it should have come in front of the council given the six month uh, rule. Councillor Moody, uh, sorry, Mr Moody, beg your pardon, uh, Mr Moody pointed out that uh, he felt that there were material changes uh, within the agenda item and therefore it met standing orders. At the time, I agreed to disagree. Having looked into it further, I disagree uh, with Mr. Moody's interpretation. Um, Councillor McCabe, it's just relevant to your motion. Well, it is, yes. Um, and, and the fact that it's contained within my motion, you know, that I do say the item should not have appeared on the agenda, standing order 35.1, paragraph 4, not uh, having been complied with. Just within that uh, promise, I'd like to... No, I don't see that anywhere. Where does it say that in your uh, motion, Councillor McCabe? Oh, I do beg your pardon. Sorry, Provost. I, I, I do beg your pardon. That was actually a press release that I put out. My apologies. It's okay. Sincerely. Um, I need to get my uh, motion because I forgot what it was now. Um, Realistically, where, where we are is that we put uh, we, we brought forward uh, the Bones Rex uh, discussion, and we made a decision uh, on that. Uh, they actually closed the, the Bones Rex um, Centre. Do you need a copy of your motion, Councillor McCann? Yeah, I'm just... I think there's one here, if you need it. That'd be great, thanks, uh, Provost. If... It's on page C, Councillor McCabe. Is it? Oh, page, uh, blank. page C on your agenda pack. Page Sorry, Brian. Yeah. Oh, getting you make that we'll walk that distance. Sorry, Brian. Um, sorry, Provost. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Perry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was to do with the uh, the, the closure of the uh, the bonus wrecks and um, the immediate closure. Um, when you look at face value at the WPS report. It would appear to be the only option that was available to the council. However, it was the existence of the 2019 report from Development Services which caused me 
great concern. What it's stated in it is that uh, in view of the hazard to the public, and that immediately sets alarm bells uh, uh, ringing. A specialist contractor should be appointed to repair the swimming pool. The question I had is what repairs were carried about, out by a specialist contractor? What risk were the council exposed to during the periods of repairs being required? I've not had a, an adequate answer to that as yet. My major concern here and the reason for the motion is that within the Bones Rex article, we made a decision which I feel was based not on full information. And that's clearly obvious when we get a, a subsequent WPS report, which included which included a development services report of 2019. And again, I have concerns with the, uh, the development services report that was, uh, was copied to us and the fact that it is redacted. That's a council document that we are entitled to see. It therefore shouldn't have been redacted. And from that, it would allow us to identify who the author of it was and potentially the distribution list of who that had gone to. The big question for me is who was aware of this in the council? And how did it come to light in January or February of, of this year? It's an inert object. It doesn't bump out of somebody's drawer and shout, here I am, you haven't looked at me for a couple of months. Uh, let's have a read at me. Somebody's got to have known about this. Somebody's got to have identified that. Within the, uh, the development services report, there's a couple of photographs taken. You then go to the WPS report, and it's almost the same photographs. It doesn't really show any particular deterioration to the condition of the pool. And there are a number of questions that I could ask. Repairs were apparently carried out. It's referred to in the Curry Brown report. They say that uh, there's evidence of some repairs. If those repairs were carried out and they were quite satisfactory, could we not be carrying out the uh, similar uh, type repairs? Provis, Provis, the, the, Provis the, sorry, I've not seen the relation to the motion. Yes, I was just going to um, say that, yeah, Councillor, make a joint. Um, it, it, your, your motion tends to sort of, uh, the first of it is you're seeking uh, that no other council uh, facilities uh, have, have got safety concerns. That's the sort of thrust of your motion, it's not to revisit the, the, the decision on the Bonaire Recreation Centre. I totally understand that, Provis, but I feel that I have, to, I have to highlight that because I know that I'm going to get resistance to the fact that I'm asking for um, officers to, uh, to come back and look at other um, council assets. The reason that I say that is Within a report, the Curry Brown report that was commissioned to do with bonus, bear with me, Provis, this is all to do with seeking further, uh, further uh, reports into other assets. As much as it's bonus, put that to the side for a minute, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. I am talking about future uh, reports. Within this, uh, the Curry Brown report that was submitted uh, to Council, it did not contain the 2019 report. They should have been aware of that. There was three reports, three draft reports that came in from Curry Brown and nowhere within that did it mention the 2019 report from Development Services. Also within the Curry Brown report, it actually referred to a EIC, an Electrical Compliance Certificate of 2015. Had the Curry Brown report identified the electrical equipment within the Bowness Rex, you can see within the electrical on the electrical equipment there are actually tags to identify this equipment was um, investigated or checked in 2020, because that is then recorded in the EIC R certificate of 2020. The question. On that is why was that not included within the twenty? Uh, sorry, the, the Curry Brown report, right? 
It came in front of officers. Officers should have identified. They were talking about five years out of date EICR certificate. So therefore, they should have been looking at a 2020 certificate, which showed that all electrical equipment was in compliance. Other than that, we would have been out of uh, compliance. We would have failed. We were aware that the existence of this 2020 electrical compliance certificate um, meant that the Bone S Rex was functioning as, as it should do. It should have been contained within um, within the Curry Brown report. We then subsequently commissioned a WSP report. And that's when the question of the 2019 report comes up from development services. So it's a grave concern to me that we are being asked to accept that there's been reports done on other uh, council assets and that we should just go along with that. What I'm saying to you is within the one example that's come across the council, there is enough questions to be asked of the accuracy of these condition reports. The condition report for Bowness was very subjective. It was very questionable. I had I had a look at the um within the Curry Brown report, there were huge elements of it missing. One of the biggest things was this thing here, a schedule seven. Yes, Mickey, this is beginning to seem like a, a debate on the bonus recreation centre, and that's more the thrust of your motion. I appreciate it, Provost, but as I said... And we're not revisiting that. That's not the thrust of it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aiming to revisit it. What I am saying is that the amount of information that was unavailable to councillors, like these reports, makes the whole question of uh, not investigating... Um, I'm not asking to carry out uh, uh, additional uh, reports on... <laughs> Council officers, yeah, to, McLean, you've got half a minute left. Council officers are tasked to perform a full ad, uh, audit of all property assets previously located within the portfolio of the community trust to ensure that no other facility remains a safety concern to residents and users of council facilities. If we don't ask for that, if we don't support this motion, if we are going to abstain in supporting this motion, what you're doing is actually accepting that we're not going to look at any potential problems. We might be aware of the potential problems, but if we abstain in voting for this, we're actually making decisions which are not based on full facts, full knowledge, and I think that's a grave, it should be a grave concern to every councillor within the council. Thanks very Thanks much, Councillor so McCabe. That's your eight minutes. Thank you. Do you have a second, Doc? Um, please to second the motion and reserve the right. I'll come back later. Thank you very much, Councillor Spears. Uh, maybe Councillor Nicol John, do you have a... Or Councillor Gardner, do you have an amendment? Or you Thank you, Provost. Yes, uh, I have an amendment and it will be circulated, uh, I think, just now. Thanks, Mike. Council notes that all buildings subject to the SPR have had a full building condition survey undertaken. These have provided the Council okay. with information on each asset included in the review, and none of these have identified an issue of the magnitude or an immediate health and safety concern such as a structural problem at the pool wall at BRC. Where surveys have identified any compliance or condition risk issues requiring immediate action, these are being addressed. Council further, Council further notes that condition surveys are being carried out across major buildings and the learning estate. Council agrees that this work provides adequate assurance on the safety of buildings and the further audit is not required. That's it, Provost. Thanks very much, Councillor Garner. Now go to Councillor Hannah. Do you happen to have an amendment, Councillor Hannah? I do not have an amendment. Okay. Uh, Bill Kerr? No amendment, Provost. <laughs> Provost, can, can I formally second if it was right? That's Thank you. And Councillor McCabe say uh, uh, this is a motion. So, do any independents have an amendment? I don't have an amendment, but um, 
Is it going to be emailed round as well, just so we can see the text of what Councillor Garner's just read out? Aye, ah, it'll, it'll be emailed round to Councillor Murta. Thank so you. So we'll go to Councillor Gar Councillor Hannah, do you have any comment you'd like to make? Or? I, I would like to ask for a recess, since the amendment has just been circulated. OK, 10 minutes, that do it. 10, 10 minutes, 10 minute recess.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll just we'll just open up the debate. If anybody's got any questions on uh, motions or amendment. Okay, can I come with a question first? Mr. Spears. Uh, the SNP amendment mentions in the first paragraph that, um, and the, the last four words, these are being processed. These are being addressed, sorry. Can I ask, is that all the council facilities, all the council pools, or does this apply to the SPR? Uh, and the asset realisation buildings only. Okay. Mr. Michael or Councillor Garland, you want to take that? I think uh, Mr. Ketchik could probably answer that better Ketchik. than me, Phil, more fuller. Provost, as a, as a responsible property owner, our, our approach to property compliance and health and safety is that where we identify issues, we deal with them. Okay, thank you. Um, well, that, that's concerning as well because. So was Bowness Recreation Centre, and there was a report done in 2019. Now, I don't think I was on the Community Trust at the time, but I have spoken to various people who are, and can never have no recollection of uh, this report coming forward, which is concerning if it's the Community Trust. Now, I realise it's no longer in being, but there is always heritable or heritage uh, responsibilities. And if so it's the the question then, around uh, is the trust properties all included in the SBR, is that what you were saying? And and the yeah. amendment. Right. Right, so and they are. That's all properties. Yes. Okay. Uh, that would be interesting then to look at some of the reports. Okay, thank because you. Because the concerns have been raised. But I will come back okay. to just hey, Bill Care. Yeah, thanks, Provost. Uh, Two or three questions. What's the difference between a condition survey and a full audit? Mr. Kerfoot? I would really like somebody to define that. Also, clearly the condition surveys are done in accordance with a template that, that's agreed for undertaking condition surveys. The audit would go beyond that, um, and the audit would include, as is happening at the moment, Discussions with colleagues who were in those those historic times. Condition survey, in effect, is a here and now assessment of condition. If you were doing a full audit, you would be looking back historic records and things like that as the stuff that's went on. And just that the motion says a full audit, and the amendment says condition survey. So I just want to see if there was a, a difference or if they're the same thing. Mm. I, 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 I don't quite I understand. Speak for the for the authors of the, of the motion or the amendment, but my interpretation would be is the condition surveys are even mm. now that's what we are doing and that's what we're looking, you know, projecting forward in terms of what we need to deal with. If you're looking at an audit, I think that's more reflective as to what's happened in the past. In terms of these properties, and clearly, I can't comment on things that have went on you know, prior to myself. Yeah. Um, my other question, probably known for uh, Councillor Spears, just to clarify. So, on one of the on the motion, it talks about community trust portfolio, and an amendment that's all buildings in the SPR. Have we got any buildings that's in it aren't in any of the two of them? The answer is no. Um, all the SPR, but between the SPR and the major buildings, which is in the second paragraph of the amendment, that covers all the properties that were formerly occupied by the trust. Right. Okay. So places like stadium, the. Manor Centre, Calendar House, they're all covered in the OK. Thank, thank you very much, Paul. And that's fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much, Billy Kerr. Councillor McIntyre, then Councillor Murta. 
think Councillor Hannah was actually before. Oh, sorry, Councillor Hannah. My uh, apologies. Thank you, Provost. Can I just ask uh, our officers, please, what actions are being taken to ensure the safety of all our existing assets? Will that continue to be the case? And what assurance can you give us that properties are safe and going to continue to be safe? Because clearly that is the intention of the motion, to ensure that we have assurance of the safety of properties. It's not just about the safety, it's also about the way in which um, the, the public perceive the situation. Um, I mean, there have been issues in my ward because of the way some of previous reports came forward that caused problems for some of the local assets and local groups. So it's about ensuring, A, that safety is maintained and, B, that our communities have the assurance that that is the case. Could you give me a, a few comments on what is being done? Mr Kerfrick. Thank you, Provost. So, as, as members will be aware, um, since I've, I've taken post, we've now undertaken substantial condition assessments across the portfolio, to, which has identified a number of condition issues. We've also identified compliance issues, which have all been actioned um, or are being actioned as, as they arise and are being dealt with. We've also had challenges in relation to compliance matters, whether it's Legionella, asbestos and things like that and again we're putting a team in place who manage that so you know we're doing everything we can to ensure that our buildings are fit for purpose and safe uh, for both our, our, our customers and for the staff working in thank you thanks very much councillor hannah councillor michael john and councillor Marta. thank you um provost i was just going to ask um what would a further audit change in relation to the current position of, of the buildings? What what's more is it going to tell us, particularly about our category T a category D buildings, um, that uh, we would change the approach that we've got at the moment and to carry out what's called a and, and refer to as a full audit, and, and I, I want to just maybe define between the full audit that is referred to as opposed to the work that has it been asked to be done by our audit um, team in relation to process um, what that, that might cost um, to the council in time and money? Uh, I know that might be a, a bit of a, a whistle in the wind, um, but if, if there's a, a, an indication, that would be helpful. Mr Kedrick? Um, and I think it comes down to the interpretation of what a full audit is. I certainly am of the view that uh, an audit of everything that, that we have in relation to our buildings is, is reflective and it looks back the way it would not add anything to the condition surveys that we've got at the moment or our compliance records and the work that colleagues are doing in terms of the challenges we need to meet from now and going forward. And, and any indication of the, the, t the time and the cost that would be related to having to do? I have uh, no idea of the cost, but clearly we would be diverting staff you know, from dealing with the here and the now and looking forward to actually go back through things that have occurred in the past that we can't change. And um, so through you, Provost, just to, to say that that would be the same staff that we would be expecting to perhaps take forward in um, the development of the capital programme, particularly around their sports and leisure. Potentially some of those would be involved. OK, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Councillor Mikadron. We'll go to Councillor Marta. Thanks, Provost. And I think similar to, to Bailey Care, I, you know, I, I looking at the wording of the amendment, the wording of the motion, I think the substantive point here is that there is a concern that what happened, and it's in relation to the building of the, you know, um, itself with the, the BRC, what happened was that there is a report, and from the questions earlier asked in this meeting, that existed in 2019 that ended up it showed very serious concerns and those very serious concerns are mirrored by a report that was done on the 29th of um, February and I think the substantive point of this motion is that if nobody knew that that report existed but that in effect um, was there all along and the condition should have been there should have been action taken on that report I think that's why um, there is being there is a call here to ensure that you know I'd and I, I take the point there's an internal process going on to establish what happened in that case. 
But the concern is that something happened which meant that that report was not available to members at any point during the SPR process, any point during the condition surveys that had been done. And had it been, that have might, might have meant very discussions and decisions around that building. But also if, it, if a report of that nature existed in terms of any other buildings, also to do with them. And I take the point that was being said in the amendment is that there's no other evidence of such a report or su such a uh, situation in any other building. But until the point that we saw that after the 29th of February this year, when that report was, was issued uh, from 2019, none of us knew that either. And I think that's why potentially it is important to reflect because when I first saw that report, I mean, I was um, portfolio holder for public protection at the time, and that includes notification of things which are dangerous buildings. And it is clear that when the decision that's been made recently to close the pool in the BRC is in relation to a public safety issue. It was a trust building at the time, but even so, if it had been a dangerous situation, I would have expected to know about that. I certainly didn't know. And having gone back through all the records in ter in terms of whether those things were reported to council in terms of the, the need for investment, it's clear that that wasn't reported in any of the, the bids for capital. So I think that's that's why it's relevant, because if there are other reports which may exist that are not known about, um, I don't know how this report was uncovered in relation to the, to the bonus rec swimming pool, but it was. Um, and I think that's what's led to the imperative to assure councillors that this is not the situation in any others, because when the when the um, strategic property review reports were prepared and the condition surveys initially done, this information was not known. So I think it's a, a laudable and important aspiration that the recommendations have brought forward in highlighting that. Um, I take and I very much understand where Councillor Mikkeljohn is going in terms of cost and resources. Um, but essentially what the SNP argument seems to be is that effectively this work in terms of understanding the condition of the entire estate is already ongoing. So it's not saying, well, don't do what Councillor McCabe is asking for and do something else instead. It's saying this is already going on and that should be enough. And I think that actually what the amendment, what the motion is calling for is a little bit more than that, because it's saying if this problem existed with the BIRC and a report existed and we didn't know it was, then, then you know, there potentially are um, buildings that could could be in a similar position and we don't know. So I, I think that the, the two, you know, I don't think that that should draw, um, you know, huge amounts of extra resources just to be able to do a check. If it could be found in BRC, it could be found in others. So so I'm I'm inclined to think that, you know, it is important um, what's asked for in the, in the motion. And I don't think that the, the amendment, um, I don't think the amendment cancels out. I don't think it's necessarily contradictory, um, but I think um, I'd be more inclined at supporting the motion in that regard. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Murka. We'll move to Mr. Benny. Thank you, Boris. I'm just a little bit concerned because the, the suggestion I'm taking from that is we need to do a, um, a review, an audit, to find out if there's things wrong with our buildings that we don't know about. But the condition survey that we had done on the Bowness Recreation Centre highlighted concerns about the building. So there was no difference about the condition of that building. The, the survey that we did identified the concerns. We would be in a much different position if the condition survey that we got done by the external contractors had not highlighted that issue, but we had our own report that showed it was a problem. So what we've actually got here is a condition survey that highlighted a problem with Bowness Recreation Centre, which we flagged up to council and took action on. I have that, that surely evidences that the condition survey process is effective at identifying problems with the building. My appeal to you here, and obviously it's up to yourselves entirely, do not send my officers on an exercise to review historical activity on these properties, which will not do anything other than potentially identify that things should have been done differently. That maybe is the case, but what we do know is what needs to be done now. And I want that team 
focusing on fixing the problems that we've got. We've just done a condition survey on every property. I agree there is something concerning about the bonus recreation centre and that's why I've been at pains to communicate with elected members to say I've asked for an internal fact-finding exercise and I will come back and update but yeah, please do not ask me to divert resources onto a backward look at project which will not make our buildings any safer than the activity that we're going to be doing now. Commissioner Bundy. Uh, thank Sorry, you, Professor. Uh, could, could I come back? Because I think that what it appeared to me was that Mr. Benny was responding to something that I was saying in terms of the debate there. Um, and I just wanted to clarify on that. Okay. okay. Well, I, I think I I I can hear Mr. Benny's appeal on that and on on the not sending officers and I agree not to use additional resources but to me what is what I was highlighting is that the definition about what is a what is a backwards like how much an audit, an audit has to be about I think what is the concern here is just ensuring there's a process it doesn't need to be um, you know, going through every single record and in, in, you know, forensic about the, all the trust records. But clearly, as you say, there was an issue. I know what you're saying about going forward and, and um, making sure that the condition surveys as they are, are robust. But I think that it's important that elected members do understand and have surety that that process is, that there are not been things that are missed in that process. And I think that the two, the motion and amendment, could agree on some sort of definition um, that wouldn't have extra resources, at, at, you know, to to that degree, and that would be my appeal. That I think that there, if there could be a definition of what is being asked for, Miss, maybe Councillor McCabe can come back on that. Then that would help. But I don't see it's not the spirit of the motion that I think is the problem. It's just the allocation of the the, the resources. I think is the issue. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Mutter. Councillor Bundy. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm quite content with the amendment um, in terms of the survey condition. I think uh, Malcolm's explanation about Bowness Recreation Centre saying a survey was undertaken and the issues were highlighted by that. But I also think that Councillor McCabe has highlighted a real problem here, which is that there was a report undertaken four and a half, five years ago that elected members seem to be completely unaware of. And I know there's um, the historic reasons for that with the trust and the council being different, but it is concerning that even elected members who were on the trust seem to be unaware of this. So when councillors are making decisions, we want all the information. And if that wasn't happening with the trust, when the trust had ownership, there is potential there for a scope and a review to see what happened, because that is a democratic, um, well, a lack of democratic accountability, honestly. And if you cannot access information when the trust handed the control of these buildings back to the council, so council officers could say, this is where the documents were, these were the issues highlighted. Why is that not the case? Why does council officers not ask for that information to be clearly defined in a single document? And why did council lawyers not ask for that information when getting back? And it kind of links back to the point I was making earlier about the maintenance backlog. Because if we didn't know the state of buildings coming back under council control, then why would nobody ask them those questions? So I think there is something to look at there, but I don't think this motion is worded correctly to do that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Bundy. Councillor Michael John, then I'll go to Councillor. Okay, Mr. Bay, do you like to come in again? Um, through you, Provis. I think it's important to make the point that at this stage we do not know. I feel like in your contribution there, there was some suggestions about the trust. We don't at this point know exactly how the decisions came about, how this report where this report went. So I think we should not prejudge what has happened. And I think that's why it's really important, in my personal view, that we wait until the fact-finding exercise is finished to identify what the problem was in this situation that then informs the solution that's required. Because I don't feel we should jump 
too far down the road of prescribing what the solution is or suggesting that there was a failure at anyone's sort of process until we get that information. So I'm not disagreeing with the sense that you're raising about the process that took place, but I would say there is an ongoing fact-finding exercise to identify what the flaws were in that situation. And then when we bring that back, that's for me the time when you can reach an informed decision about this wider exercise, if that was what you so wanted. Uh, I take that on board, um, Malcolm. Um, would that review just be for Bowness Recreation Centre or would it be for the properties in the Trust? So that, that review will be about the circumstances of the report to do with the Bowness Recreation Centre, but clearly what comes out of that will inform what maybe did or did not happen at the time, which then says, well, how wider problem was this or or not? Okay, yeah, we'll go to uh, Councillor Michael John, then Councillor Spears, then we'll go to there's Councillor Martha Walton back in the game. Oh, Councillor Spears, okay. uh, Michael um, I, I only asked some questions. I'm, I'm only going to briefly say something because Malcolm has um, said a, a wee bit of what I, I was going to um, just highlight. Um, we've had, uh, we've asked internal audit to do a piece of work and that might be something that at some point we maybe want to um, not necessarily today is, is give an overview of what internal audit's role is, not specific to the, the item, um, but just in general, and then how they will look at the process um, that, that um, was, was gone about. And um, hopefully they will then come back with recommendations about the process that we can then look to amend, not just in relation to the bonus rec, because it, it's in general. And I think it's a very helpful process to go through through but just to highlight it officers actually brought this to us in the first place um which i commend them for doing um because um you know they, they, they came across this information um perhaps a wee bit more by accident than than the, the than design and felt it was important that they shared that with members um which was, was good to be able to do um i was on the trust um i can't remember when my term finished um but again like Councillor Spears, I don't remember a report being brought forward um, to the trust members at that time um, in relation to the Bowness Recreation, Recreation Centre um, or any significant concerns other than the heating system, the boiler, um, which we did have problems with in 2018. Um, so that, that's just a, a specific example that I was aware of as a member of the, of the trust at the time. Um, but that could have been met could have been dealt with at an officer level. We don't know. And as there are members of the, the trust um, that are no longer within the council, um, then we may not have all the facts, but it's for our internal audit to do, and we need to allow them to do the piece of work unhindered um, by elected members and um, get their report in due course. OK, thanks, Councillor. We'll draw the light Councillor Spears then. OK, thank you. This, in seconding this motion, I don't do it as an elected member. I do it as a corporate parent. And every person out there who uses our facilities and whose children use our facilities look to us as a corporate parent. They expect us to know every report. They expect us to be surveyors, uh, quantity engineers, uh, electrical engineers and everything else were not, but we are responsible for the facilities that they use. And this report asks us to be responsible. It asks us to know the information we are getting is as correct as it can be, but especially that it's up to date. Now, the concerns here, I'm not just about Bonex Recreation Centre, they're about every facility we have. Because if something happened in one of these facilities, you should better realise the authorities would want a report, they'd want an audit, and they'd want it too sweet. The first I heard of this Development Services Report of 2019 was about two weeks ago. And yes, uh, like other members of the Trust, You've got to really search your mind 
everybody will know the amount of information that, that comes across our desks. But I think I would have remembered there's something as big as that this pool was recommended to be closed and subsequently the recreation centre was to be bulldozed and knocked down. Well, I'm a Grangemouth councillor and I've always seen Bonesses, as our sister town on the 4th. And we stick together and we help each other. And that's only right and true. And every councillor should realise that it's not just about their own elected ward and if their pool's OK. We've got to make sure. It's like having a football team when they to play because all the other teams have been closed down. Right. There is real concern about the state of our facilities. And I think it's only right that we should answer these concerns as a corporate parent. So the recommendations for a full audit of all the properties and assets are justified. But I'll finish on a small line that was gone through my mind regarding pools. We've got to learn that any mistakes we've made, but we've also got to be big enough to say we were in possession of knowledge that we didn't enact at the time, right? Enacting it when it suits you isn't being a corporate parent. But um, there is deep concerns, and we shouldn't only be looking at the shallow end of these concerns. These questions, I'm here to make a splash, but I will say, dive in and deliver a full audit on our facility. Hey, thanks very much, <coughs> Councillor Spears. We've got you, Councillor Ritchie. Thanks, Provost. Um, to me, as councillors, we all need to know all the facts before we can make a decision. That's not just about the BRC. That's about everything that we actually have to take forward. It just, uh, I'm really worried after what's happened at the, the BC, uh, BRC that there is other issues in other areas due to us no uh, maintaining uh, our other facilities. Um, the decision that we did make about the BRC, um, I wouldn't like it to happen at other areas and the way it was done, because it does cause a lot of ill feeling, and it's caused a lot of ill feeling in Bowness and Blackness and the surrounding areas because they came for all over to go to Bowness to swim. So we need to carry out audits just in case. We didn't account for five years. Or, well, we were told, weren't told for five years about the dangers, supposedly, at the BRC and in the swimming pool. My grandparent was in that swimming pool that weekend. Now, do you think we would have had them if, there if we had been told that? We had this report on the Friday. It never got close to the Monday. It's, it's no on. And I am just worried. Is other parents, is other grandparents going to go through? It's no right. All we're asking for is the correct information to come forward. Let's have a look at all these buildings. Because I did say at one of our updates that we got that Grangemouth and the Mariner, watch for these two. They'll be coming forward. So I'll be going with the motion for this one. OK, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Ritchie. We'll now go to Councillor Nimmo. Thanks, Provost. Just a, a quick question for uh, Mr. Binney, if I, if I can. Malcolm, you mentioned the, the 2019 report, and it's been mentioned that a few times. You obviously haven't been able to get your hands on this report, and that's why you've referred it to audit for them to, to look into it. What confidence do you actually have in an audit coming forward with this report? Mr. Binney? Uh, through you, Provost. We do have a copy of the report. The, the report was circulated to elected members on... Um, Feel like about the 7th of February. Um, it was uh, attached to the um, WSP report. Um, so we've got the report. I've got full confidence that audit will do a professional job to um, speak to all the people who currently work for the council that were there at the time, but also that they'll make their best endeavours to speak to those people who previously worked for the council at the same time. And I'll be bringing a report 
you know um back that uh, determines what what the outcome of that was right so it's not the actual report that's missing it's the background and the lead up to the report that you're you're right. looking for I think, and just to be clear, because I, I wasn't sure if I got a sense from a contribution there that there's a sense that myself and Paul knew about this report. We did not know about this report existence until very shortly before the council meeting in January. So there was no at all sense that I'm delivering this report when it suits me. I am concerned that when a report of this magnitude is written, that no action is taken on it. And that's why an audit fact-finding exercise has been commissioned to find out who asked for the report what happened with the report once it was done why potentially did the remedial works not get engaged etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm as interested as you all are to find out what happened with this report okay thanks for that i wasn't insinuating anything at all i was just looking for some background thanks very much yeah, thank you uh, go to councillor bruce yeah, thank you promise um, apologies, Councillor Bruce. I'm told Councillor Benny was first. That's fine. Right. It's Bruce. Right, thank you, Provost. Uh, I, I really want to share a bit of inventory, and maybe I'll be here already, but I was on the Trust Board, I loved it actually, from 2017 to 2022. So I'm just wondering, because um, I like sharing is everybody aware, uh, the Trust performance, it might help everybody in the deliberations as we move forward, our performance is on our internet and in that it's got uh, 11 annual reports, 42 quarterly reports, 15 audited accounts, 4 complaints performance reports. But if people want it, I can share the link. But it's, it's www Falkirk Leisure and Culture about us, Falkirk Community Trust. So that might help people moving on in the future if you're looking for a bit of information, a bit of information and finding out, because I can never remember what happened four years ago, find out what happened four, five years ago. That might help if it's, if it's already on the record. Right, thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Benny. I'll go to Councillor Bruce Luke. Uh, th thank you, Provost. Um, in my personal life, I've been dealing with condition surveys for 30 years. And there's many people like, just like Malcolm and Paul, who produce these things and there's building surveyors and things like that do them. They then indicate where there's a potential of a problem. They then call in a specialist, uh, whether it's a structural repair, electrical repair, whatever. They call that in to get the, the detail on it and get the cost so that it can get repaired. Can I say that's exactly what Malcolm and Paul have done in this case? They have got, a, they've done a condition survey. Uh, on one building, but they've done condition surveys in all the buildings, and I'm sure that any building, if they've, they've got to come out of the conditions surveys that said something was dangerous, they would have had a specialist in. In this case, they've used WSP, who are one of the most renowned structural engineers in Scotland, so uh, they're, they're not getting a, uh, just a general guy in to do it, they're actually getting a highly qualified company in to, to specify that. So you have done the right thing. The conditions, the condition surveys have done their job and they've identified a problem. You've done your job by then getting someone in beyond that. Yes, there is something that has come up with a report from 2019. Again, you've done the right thing by putting it to, to uh, internal audit. So is it, and you're trying to keep its independence. I am quite concerned that I hear a number of things today where people are comment, commenting what audit are going to do and how that's going to come out. That's got to be left to be independent. So is it what you report back to us is pure fact, not pressurised, not tainted in any way whatsoever. I thank you for, for doing that. And what happened in 2019 will come out in audit um, on whatever it is. It might be nothing to do with the trust. It, it, who knows what it will be, be to do. Let internal audit do that. On top of that, trust the system which 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 our officers have worked, which normal business works every day in that side of the building industry, which they do a condition survey. If they find a problem, they then get it repaired by somebody who's a specialist in that side. They've done that and they've done that correctly. Yeah, thanks Thank very much, Councillor Bruce. Hey, Councillor Murta, you've been in twice already. Do you have a question? I have a notice of a potential for the amendment, basically, but what I'm looking at is whether consensus couldn't be reached. And um, 
what I want, what I want, I have a, a text here of a potential that could bring the two things together. Um, but I don't know whether it's better to do that over recess or just to to float that as an idea now and see what the committee, what the council might think. Carry on. So basically, in where um, Councillor McCabe's recommendations are in his motion to change where he's got council officers are tasked to perform a full audit of all property assets, etc. So if it read council officers are tasked to perform stroke update a full building condition survey of all property assets previously located within the portfolio of the community trust. So it would just change out, but it would have an effect, the same effect as both, I think, what Councillor McCabe is trying to achieve and what everybody is saying in terms of their concern, but also bring in the fact that some of these things have had condition surveys and recently updated. So it's a case of confirming that and giving surety. And then to add, Furthermore, that the results of the internal audit already underway in response to the specific issue of the BRC report in 2019 are brought back to a future, future meeting of council for further consideration, as that's what Mr Benny has effectively said is going to happen. And then the audit specific issues about what happened in that case would actually be dealt with with that, which I think is a, a part intention of the motion. So it's a suggestion that I think could bring both sides in that sense together and alleviate some of the concerns about resources and I could formally move that as a potential for as a further amendment but I wondered what the the mover of the motion and amendment would think about it. Okay thanks Councillor Murta. We'll go to Councillor McCabe see what he thinks. <laughs> thanks Provost. Um, difficult position uh, just been put in there by uh, Councillor Murta. Um, I'd probably like a wee recess, but maybe after I, if you'd allow me to uh, respond to some comments that have been made. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, no you've been tell to, well, be you'd be summing up and that would be it finished. <clears throat> can we have a recess? Can, can, can I, before we, we finish, um, uh, just a, a, a question about the including the internal audit process within the, 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 the motion kind of compounds things and I think you just need to be careful around that and again my understanding is that we'd first go to the audit committee and the audit committee would then pass on a recommendation if there was to be a change to to either the executive or, or, or to council and um, so I think it, it's it's maybe compounding things and I am not seeing what Councillor Murta is is actually proposing as being any different to what's in the amendment around the full condition survey been updated. You just stole exactly what I was going to say, so I need to Okay, so maybe Mr. Moody could sum, sum up where we are at the minute. Oh, I'll try, Provost. Um, I think I didn't hear all of the text that Councillor Murta was proposing, uh, so I don't, I can't comment in detail on what it is she's been saying. The point made by uh, Councillor Miko John about the outcome of the audit investigation going first to the audit committee, I think is correct. It wouldn't be the right thing for it to come directly to the council. But there's obviously a broader thrust than that in what Councillor Marta is proposing. Um, it's for the mover of the motion and to second or to decide if he wishes to adopt any of those recommendations. The issue on the audit committee, I think, has, is as I've advised. Alternatively, on the procedural basis, Councillor Marta has indicated this may come forward as a further amendment. She's entitled to um, make a further amendment if uh, Councillor McCabe is not adopting all or any of the suggestions which she makes in relation to his motion. So I think that's where we are procedurally. I, from my own part, I think it would be helpful for people to be able to see the, the text which Councillor Marta is proposing, and that's whether it comes as a further amendment after we deal with this motion and amendment, or um, to allow Councillor Marta to consider whether he wishes to adopt it. Just on that very point, uh, well done. Um, if we can maybe just have a recess, I'll try and have a, a bit of dialogue with uh, Councillor Murta to see if we can maybe uh, come up with a, a form of words which 
identify some of the uh, the issues that have been uh, raised by uh, the administration. Yeah. Uh, hello, we do 15 minutes? Or? Five, 10 minutes. Five, ten, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 Thanks, minutes. Yes, thank you. Brother, just before, just before you go for that, I got there. There's going to be a a break to discuss. That'll come back. Then there'll be another break to discuss. It's quarter past three. We've only had a vote today, and it's quarter past three in the afternoon. Back I'm just, I'm just, I'm just highlighting that it's going to be. Well, entitled to a recess. I don't think we're going to come back to a recess upon a recess, uh, Provost. I'm hoping that, um, you know, we've got a dialogue to have a uh, Council of will resolve the issue and then we can just go into my, potentially my summing up and then whether it goes to yeah, the vote. Uh, yeah. yeah. Provost, we would certainly need to see the wording of it as well. I think so. So is somebody going to write it up? Yeah, if you could, a recess would help with that as well because, you know, multitasking is a skill, but it's still, it's good to do it when not, everybody's not talking at you, so... Okay, so if it can be written up and circulated, maybe sent say, say to Mr. Parry and get right it circulated. Then. Okay, thank right you. Then. Ten minutes recess.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll go to Councillor McCabe. Councillor McCabe. Um, sorry, uh, Provost. Um, I'm just trying to think uh, procedurally whether uh, Councillor Murta, we've had a wee bit of dialogue there about uh, coming towards a common wording. Have we quite agreed on it? So I don't know if maybe Councillor Murta wants to come in with her um, uh, indication of a further amendment and whether you would want me to speak beforehand. Entirely in your hands. Obviously, I think if there's not agreement between uh, Councillor Mayor Cape and Councillor Marta, then the best thing to do would be to go to the summing up on Councillor McCabe's motion as it stands. And then if Councillor Marta has already given a notice of further amendment, and we would have an opportunity to consider that text okay. after we've heard uh, taking the vote on the Councillor McCabe's motion. But we, Councillor McCabe's entitled to sum up. Okay, if you'd like to sum up, Councillor McCabe. Thanks very much, uh, Colin, for uh, explaining that. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, the motion, I felt, was fairly straightforward. But we then received uh, the SNP amendment, which uh, indicates that um, the buildings subject to the SBR have uh, a full building condition survey undertaken, and none identified an issue of the magnitude or an immediate health and safety concern. Neither did the condition survey undertaken by Curry and Brown into Bonehead Rex. That's precisely my point. The condition survey that we were uh, provided with did not identify an issue of the magnitude or an immediate health and safety concern. That condition report Colleen Brown report that actually identifies within the report that the overall building fabric is rated as a C, not a category D. So the very thing that we closed this, th uh, this building down for wasn't actually identified within the, the, the BRC report. Condition C. Work required to prevent deterioration of the fabric or services, i.e. is currently or will become condition C or D within five years, but not sufficiently so. Mr McCabe, we're back to discussing the, uh, the closure of the Bone F REC, and we're no longer going to do an in-depth analysis of that. So it's really about your, your specific motion regarding the properties and whether they should be audited or not. Exactly my point, uh, uh, Provost. Um, what I'm saying is that one condition uh, survey that's been thrown in front of us or put in front of us to have a look at has been flawed. And that's why I, I think it's imperative, it's imperative that we should um, uh, carry out an audit. And what I'm suggesting is that the, uh, the audit is not to disregard the condition reports which are already apparently in our, in our ownership, but it's to actually augment the condition reports. Um, I don't think the condition reports that we, um, we have are sufficiently detailed to assure the Council of the safety of our assets. If we need to carry out the, uh, uh, an audit, rather than a condition survey report, what the audit would hopefully identify is, are there any other 2019 reports lying in somebody else's drawer that we should be having, uh, having a look at? It's just this whole idea, Provost, that what we've, what we've got in front of us is condition surveys which are not of sufficient detail that there are Structural issues with some buildings, safety issues with some buildings, and they're not identifying them. And again, that's just to repeat myself. The only one that we got, the Curry Brown report, 
then identify the eventual thing that we close the bonus Rex down for. I'll leave it at that, promise. Thanks. Okay, thanks. thanks Pro very Provost, much. I, I have a real concern with comments that have been made there, okay. um, particularly in a public forum about the safety of our buildings. Um, I am confident that should any of our buildings be unsafe, officers would take that operational decision and close that building to ensure the safety of the public. And I would ask that Councillor McCabe withdraw those remarks um, because um, I just think it, it does not do anything for our, our, the public who use our buildings every day if they think that they're not safe, and that is not the case. Okay, that point taken. I'll go back to Councillor McCabe. What did the 2019 report identify? What did it identify? The Development Service Report identified. Provost, I don't think we should be getting into debate. And uh, if, if that I brought comment, it up, Councillor Michael that, John, that, that I'm comment. not having you. I'm not having you casting aspersions on me. Allegedly casting aspersions when I'm looking out for the safety of our constituents. And, and one is doing the correct one, one, one not appropriate in these team. circumstances. Provost, can, can we perhaps hear from the officers in relation to that? But I do have concerns about the statement that our buildings are not safe, and that's what um, Mr. McCabe is saying. Okay, we'll, we'll go. Development here. Services said yeah. our building wasn't safe in 2019. Sorry, sorry okay. Provost. So I'm just making it Mr. Benny, okay, come on. Uh, three, Provost. Um, as we've previously um, updated Council, we've done condition reports on all properties that are in the SPR, which include, includes all the trust properties. Those have highlighted actions that need to be addressed. We're addressing those. The Bowness Recreation Centre report highlighted an issue with the pool wall, which we then subsequently mm -hmm. took action to address. Um, okay, thanks very much. Uh, Councillor McCabe, you finished your summing up? Okay, so we'll now go to the vote. Yes, thank you, Provost. The motion is as set out in the agenda papers and it's moved by Councillor McCabe and seconded by Councillor Spears, against which there is an amendment moved by Councillor Garner and seconded by Councillor Miko John, which has been circulated. Provost Bissett. Abstain. Councillor Aitchison. Motion. Councillor Anslow. Abstain. Councillor Binney. Amendment. Councillor Bowes. Amendment. Councillor Bundy. Amendment. Councillor Colley. Amendment. Councillor Deacon. Amendment. Councillor Devine. Amendment. Councillor Flynn. Amendment. Councillor Forrest. Amendment. Councillor Garner. The amendment. Councillor Harnell. Abstain. Councillor Kelly. Abstain. Bailey Kerr. Amendment. Councillor McCabe. Apologies. Um, motion. Councillor Miko John. The amendment. Councillor Marta. The motion. Councillor Nimmo. Abstain. Councillor Patterson. Abstain. Councillor Patrick. Amendment. Councillor Redmond. Abstain. Councillor Ritchie. The motion. Councillor Sinclair. Amendment. Councillor Spears. Motion. And Councillor Steinbank. Abstain. Provost, there are five votes for the motion. There are 13 votes for the amendment. There were eight abstentions. The amendment is accordingly carried, and that becomes the substantive motion against which Councillor Murta has given notice of a further amendment. Okay. Would you like to speak to your further amendment, uh, Councillor Murta? Um, yeah, obviously, I'm just adjusting to see, um, because obviously now the, the SNP motion um, has become the substantive, so amending the text of the previous so motion. We've not seen the wording of. No. We haven't seen the wording of the. Well, have you circulated? Has it been circulated? I have circulated it. I don't know if it's got to everybody. I generally say it's nineteen minutes past, but I think it was delayed. 
Uh, no, it wasn't delayed. I've got I've emailed it to everybody, but of course not everybody's got their laptop, so I'm getting copies no. printed right, right That's now. That's fine. No, I, just, there was a bit of a delay while well, I was having discussions with Miss Miss Councillor McCabe, so that's why it's not come until that decision was made that Councillor McCabe was was proceeding. So apologies if that's delayed at getting to you. Um, so I'm just looking now at the what the substantive motion is. Um, I mean, do you want to wait until what you what I had circulated has got to everybody on paper? Is that easier, or? Well, I'm I, at does that. everybody just everybody just want to wait until we get to see the motion, uh, to see the amendment? Okay. We'll just wait until we get until it's printed off. Yes, sir, Thank you, Provost. Um, I've just read the the text of the amendment, and I just want to get some clarification from Colin. How does this differ from the amendment just passed by the administration? That's a good question, I think. If you excuse me for two minutes, I'm going to do a comparison on the two um, at the moment rather than um, improvise that answer uh, as I speak. So, Mr. Moody, is this the first you've seen it as well? First, anybody seen it? Can I just confirm that in effect, what it would be would be that it would just replace the bit under what was originally Councillor McCabe's original motion and it's just swapping out the recommendations because obviously it wouldn't be standing on it so when it would so that's what in effect what it would be. I, I think the, the the question probably is the difference between this and the now motion, mm -hmm. which is the, the the administration's amendment in the last debate. 
rather than what's the difference between this and Councillor McCabe's motion. So that's the point on which I was just going to spend a minute or two giving some thought. Yeah, five minutes. We'll have our five minute recess.
OK. OK, welcome back, everyone. So we'll, we'll just go to Mr. Moody. Thank you, Provost, and my apologies for the delay there and just taking some time to look at the two texts so that I could offer a, a reasoned answer to uh, Councillor Bundy's question. I think the starting point is that this, the motion which we have now, which is was the SNP amendment, essentially rel relies on the work which is underway and which has already been done in terms of the condition build, building surveys and the follow up work which is being done on the back of that. And on the basis of that, Council is being asked to agree that there's adequate assurance provided and that no further audit is required. So that's the starting point. The difference, I think, between can that and at this point. Could you want Mr. Moody finish, please? Now, the work that's been done and we've been given assurances is split into three different sections. Could, 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 could you want Mr. Moody finish, please? Provost, as I was saying, that was the starting point against which the amendment is being put. Now, the question was, what's the difference between the motion and the amendment? I think the difference is that the amendment is asking for an update of the existing condition survey. So it's not resting on the work that has already been done. It's essentially asking for another way of saying an update is a review of the building conditions survey to provide uh, additional assurance. There's one further point that I would want to raise in relation to the text of the amendment, which uses the word remains in relation to safety concerns about other facilities, because it is uh, suggestive that there are existing safety concerns within properties. And I think that would be a concerning um, wording to have within the amendment presented. I did take the time to have a brief discussion uh, with the mover of the amendment who is content to change that word from remains to presents. So it's something which is a potential but not an actuality which actually exists. The other difference of course comes in the second paragraph of the amendment which relates specifically to the audit work in relation to BRC and that being presented to the audit committee as is appropriate but thereafter the results of that process being presented to council. So those are the differences between the motion and the amendment and also to notify that there's that uh, change to the amendment as presented by Councillor Murta. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Moody. Do you have a second for your amendment, Councillor Murta? I do. I've not spoken to it yet, but I do, yes. So, so yes. you're on mute, Councillor Murta. Provost, it's Councillor Ritchie here. I'm, I'm going to second. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Um, thank you. Councillor Spears? Sorry, no, can, you, can, can you hear Sorry. me, Provost? Yes, can you hear you loud and clear? So I was just saying, I haven't spoken yet to my amendment because it was just a question and, and Colin retired to consider it, but I haven't actually spoken to it yet. OK, um, so well, I'll take a question with Councillor Spears and sure. I'll come back to you. No, um, it's, it's really for uh, Councillor Murta uh, and our people in place services. The SNP amendment, uh, it was clarified to us but not completely clarified, so I'm asking a question. Does that cover all categories under the SPR and them that are not on the SPR? Mr Kittrick. All condition surveys have been undertaken for all SPR properties, irrespective of their, con uh, their, their category. And, and them that are not on the SPR? There is a phased approach to a condition service. So, for instance, this summer, we're doing a lot in schools, condition service. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor Murta, you'd like to speak to your amendment? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, effectively, as I was mentioning before, it's an attempt to compromise to say, you know, I, I respect and obviously voted for the motion in itself because I do think that has been highlighted that what happened with 
the, the situation with the BRC in terms of the survey and the uncovering of a survey which existed, which was until that point unknown, which showed similar concerns to what was being brought in the survey that was done um, in, in the present time on the 29th of, of February. That that created some concerns that the the condition surveys that have been done and I acknowledge they have been done um, they hadn't at that point picked that up that there was a, a need for imminent closure of a building and I 100% believe that if it's uncovered by uh, officers in a condition survey that there's a need to close it that they will close it. Um, I'm not suggesting otherwise but I think that because this issue has um, created a, a degree of concern what I'd like to do is in acknowledgement of that um, is to say okay well rather than what the SNP um, amendment now the motion says that look everything that has gone on is fine and these are already done and everything is above board and don't worry about it and you know I'm hoping that that is the case but it's to say okay but that wasn't detected um, in the original condition surveys and I know that that process is ongoing so rather than saying stop everything do a full audit of everything um, over again of what's happened. I, I do agree and I agree. I take the point of what is being said by officers and what's been said by Malcolm, that the, the main point is to make sure that all we have confidence, all condition surveys are correct, up to date and don't present any risk eh, in, of those buildings, despite the fact that on one occasion, with one very specific example, there definitely was a concern that wasn't picked up until a new condition survey was done. And I accept that it's not been the audit that's picked that up. So in recognition of that and to give confidence to councillors and to the public, it's saying, OK, if these condition surveys are there, um, then let's have a let's have a check on them. Let's have a refresh of them. Let's make sure that they're there. If they aren't there, if there are any properties in which there aren't up to date condition surveys and you know, maybe there, maybe that is is not the case. Maybe they are all there and present up to date. Then we would undertake one. So rather than just saying everything is fine at the moment, it's it's giving that level of surety um, and providing that extra check. And I think that you know that should enable us to address that. Yes, there has been a an issue of concern in terms of what's been uncovered in the bonus recreation centre in terms of these reports and how that's happened. That will be investigated quite properly by audit without pressure and favour from external forces um, and that will go through the normal process but this, it should come back to council and then there might be further actions that need to be done to you know look at what what might have happened in other cases nobody knows that yet but it's important that that does come back to council and that is transparent so it's trying to achieve the main aim of ensuring that there is no concern present in our buildings acknowledging that there has been a degree of concern raised because of the, the bonus rec issue and ensuring that we do take a proper check without using, you know, I don't think copious amounts of resources if what is being said is that these have up to date condition surveys that could just be refreshed and reviewed. Um, and I think to me that seems a reasonable compromise. And what I would say, and I appreciate Colin taking the time to think about it, and I understand that this is a slightly irregular situation to come up with a motion on the hop, but to me that that's the whole point of why we're here to have debate and to try and see what we can tease out and find a way forward. And I've listened to the debate. Um, I can see an element from all sides. And this is where I think there would be a reasonable compromise that puts the safety of our residents front and centre, um, but also ensures that we have a proper check to make sure that the, the, the issues that have been uncovered at BRC aren't lurking elsewhere as well. So that's the motive behind what I've moved. Thanks, okay, Provost. Thanks very much, Councillor Mark. I'll just open it up for discussion. Robert, in, in view of the time and the fact that there's still items on the agenda, can we just move right to the vote, please? Okay, we're happy to do that. Um, we'll go to the vote then. Provost, I've not, yep. a, I've not been able to uh, second actually and say what I want to say. Sorry, I thought you seconded it, Councillor Ritchie. I just said it because you asked if, if she did have anybody to second it, but I want to tell you why I want to say, uh, actually second it. Okay, I think that's a fair comment since you're the seconder. Right, thank you, Provost. Right, then we'll go uh, to the reason vote. I'm actually, sorry? Then we'll go to the vote. Okay, okay. Um, the reason I want to second uh, this is I do feel 
I need things in place for after the audit's done uh, for it to come back to a meeting that the people at Bodess and Blackness can actually find out what happened. They are needing answers, they're still needing answers all the way through this process. Uh, what's happened, how it's been taken forward, they're getting to one thing and something else is getting done. We need all the answers and if this is, means that people have got to vote this way to actually get the answers, I'm encouraging you all to vote for this. All our communities need to know why this has happened and Boris to make sure it doesn't happen any in other in any other ward. So please vote. It's no stop what's been on before. It's just saying bring the support back. And you real if you don't vote for this, I hope to hell it never happens in your areas. Thank okay, thanks very much, Councillor. Thanks very much, Councillor Ritchie. We'll go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. And the motion is moved by Councillor Garner and it's seconded by Councillor Meeklejohn. That was previously the amendment in the previous debate, against which we have the further amendment moved by Councillor Murta and seconded by Councillor Ritchie. Provost Bissett. Abstain. <laughs> Councillor Aitchison. Amendment. Councillor Anslow. Abstain. Councillor Binney. Motion. Councillor Barris. Motion. Councillor Bundy. Motion. Councillor Colley. Motion. Councillor Deacon. Motion. Councillor Devine. Motion. Councillor Flynn. Motion. Councillor Forrest. Sorry, motion. <coughs> Councillor Garner. The motion. Councillor Hannah. Abstain. Councillor Kelly. Abstain. Billy Kerr. Motion. Councillor McCabe. Amendment. Councillor Miko John. The motion. Councillor Murta. Amendment. Councillor Nimmo. Abstain. Councillor Patterson. Abstain. Councillor Patrick. Motion. Councillor Redmond. Abstain. Councillor Ritchie. Amendment. Councillor Sinclair. Motion. Councillor Spears. Amendment. And Councillor Steinbank. Abstain. <laughs> Obviously, there are 13 votes for the motion. There are five votes for the amendment. There are eight abstentions. The motion is carried. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Moody. We'll now go to agenda item seven, review of polling districts and polling places 2023-2025, alternative options for consideration. And Mr. Laurie will be speaking to the report. Thank you, um, Provost. So, Council considered the review of polling districts and polling places at the meeting on the 1st of February and approved the polling scheme subject to further consideration of the proposals in respect of Bonus Recreation Centre and Dalgren Community Hall. So since then, officers have investigated the alternative options suggested at the previous council meeting in respect of the two polling districts in question and the pros and cons of each option have been set out at section five of the report. On the basis of that, um, St Mary's RC Primary School is a recommended polling place uh, instead of Bonus Recreation Centre and Grangemouth Rugby Club is a recommended polling place should Dalgrain Community Hall be unavailable. Um, the recommendations are set out at 2.1. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague uh, Dale Robb online uh, to deal with any uh, detailed question that members may have. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Lawyer. Go to Council Michael John. Okay, thank you, um, Provost. Um, I think um, people expressed that their concerns and raised issues at the last meeting. Those have been taken on board. I think the um, the, the, the way that the paper's been laid out with the pros and cons has been really helpful. Um, and um, I am happy just to move the recommendations in the report. Okay, thanks very much. Councillor Michael John, do you have a seconder? Sorry, I happened to say happy to say. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Councillor Garner. Um, go to Councillor Hannah to see if you have an amendment coming. We have an amendment. Councillor Nemo will be giving it. Okay, thank you. A uh, Bailey Kerr? No amendment. Councillor Spears? Uh, no amendment. Um, any of the independents, other independents have an amendment? No? Okay. So we'll go to Councillor Hannah. Uh, Councillor Nemo. 
Thanks very much, Provost. It is a, a short amendment, and I believe it has been circulated by officers in advance. Uh, I'll just read it out, just for the, the benefit of the public and those online. Council is instructed to action option two in respect of both Grangemouth and Bone S and provide mobile units on the Dalgrain Community Hall site and the, the Bone S Recreation Centre site. I'll have a few comments in relation to the, the Grangemouth situation, comma, uh, Provost, and my colleague, Councillor Aitchison, is going to second the amendment and make some comments in relation to, to Bone S. Provost, the, the alternatives that have been provided, I think you, you really need to take the geography into account as far as Grangemouth is concerned. The Grangemouth Town Hall, that's well over a mile uh, from the, the current site, uh, and the bus service would have to be radically improved to make that a, a go. The rugby club, you would have to cross a very busy dual carriageway to gain access to that, and that's far from ideal. The Scout Hall is even further away than the Grangemouth Town Hall, so that is, that's out of the question as well. What we really need is a mobile unit on the current site, uh, and I think, again, going back to the geography of Grangemouth, there's very little within the Grangemouth Old Town that could be used for this. Uh, and it is pretty central to their needs. So that's what I'm looking for as the, the local member for Grangemouth. Uh, and I'll just I'll pass over to my colleague, Councillor Aitchison, just to highlight and second uh, the amendment, Provost. Thanks very much, Councillor Nimmo. Councillor Aitchison. Yeah, thanks, Provost. Yeah, I'm happy to second this amendment. Um, those that know me know I'm pretty much against schools being used as polling stations, although uh, do see the way things are going. School will be the only things councils will have to be able to use. Come, they'll be the only builds they'll have. So, yeah, I mean, I would um, promote that there's a uh, couple of cabins put in in the car park where Bonus Recreation Centre is. Um, be far better. Um, and it will keep the kids in the schools that day. I know some days there will be in service days, but there will be other days where there would perhaps be ad hoc elections and the kids will have to lose days at school. So, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Aitchison. Um, we'll go to Councillor Spears. Thank you. I have no hesitation in uh, supporting this uh, motion. Uh, I can only really speak regarding the Dalgrain Hall, uh, a hall of which I was the chairman for some 26 years. Um, I believe that under the strategic uh, property review, there has been a declared interest by the present sitting committee. So I'd imagine that the hall will be available and be able to use. I was very interested to see a poster in the hall saying there was to be an election on, I think, the 2nd of May. And I thought, oh, well, they know more than most of the news pundits, but I understand they were asked to keep these dates clear. So if there is um, a general election in uh, November, I would imagine they would keep the whole dates clear for that date as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Spears. We'll go to Councillor Sinclair. Thanks, Provost. I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of things there. Um, having, having looked at the report um, and kind of weighed up the options that's available for, for both of the sites that's, that's mentioned in the amendment, we, we, have to, we have to bear in mind that additional units um, incur a cost to Council. Now, that's not to say that using third-party arrangements don't incur a cost. However, it would appear to me that, especially when there's a potential for any tendering situation for these porter cabins and mobile units to come in, that that money could be going out with the local area. So my preference would be if we are to use third-party arrangements for these types of things in the absence of a council-owned building being available, it would be best to keep that 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 funding within that money going to local businesses or local organisations um, where there's there's management committees in, in involved as well. But just on, on the issue of education, I think the the word in there was that lost days in school. I think over a five year period we know when elections are coming up and therefore our our education colleagues are quite deftly able to schedule in service days around about those dates. From that perspective, where there is an unscheduled election, and I know that we're coming into a, 
uh, a point where we don't know when this year's election is going to be, if it's even going to be this year, and that's not for us to decide. Um, but the ability for us, we heard earlier on in this in this meeting about the significant investment this council has made in connected Falkirk. Um, so the ability for education to be delivered in a different way in order to maintain and sustain that education is there. Uh, we have to take that into consideration. We have to be cognizant of that. So whilst I, I, I fully understand where others are coming from, I don't see why it's best value for this council to incur additional cost in using water cabins and mobile units when we have quite well established alternatives in place through this report. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Sinclair. We'll go to Councillor Ritchie. <clears throat> Thanks, Provost. Um, right, I was at a parent council cluster meeting last night. I started running them when I became a local councillor and I've had them every couple of months. So I actually had one online last night and I spoke to the chair of all the parent councils, including St Mary's Primary School. And she has been in contact with me again after she was speaking to some of her members. And they would rather that the school was kept open. It's only once every five years, as you have said, because it's a Westminster election. Um, so that it's only the one time out of every five years. But it's still due to COVID, et cetera, the times the children have been off. And it's not a cost to uh, local government. It's not a cost to Scottish government. It's the Westminster mm. government that's the cost for the containers. So I think, I, well, I know I'll be going with the motion for this one. I'll be keeping okay. my parent councils happy. Thanks very much, Councillor Richard. Councillor Devine? Uh, thank you, Provost. I, th I think when we're having this conversation, and I did raise this the last time, that we, we have to look at this. This election coming up, yes, that will be an anomaly. And as Councillor Sinclair's already said about the education, and we, it was said in the last meeting as well, we schedule this around having in-service days within the school year to cover local elections. And as much as, you know, if we were saying, you know, the kids are going to be off school all the time because that's just how we do it, then then that's a different argument. But that's not the reality here. The reality here at Falkirk Council is we schedule in service days around these said elections. So the only anomaly here would be a Westminster election, which we, we are in zero control of at the moment. We can't we can't do anything about that because we don't know when the election is going to be called. And I totally understand that and, and I respect that. And that's where we are as a council. But we can't keep going round the houses and going back to the same argument. Like it doesn't impact on children's education because we schedule in service days. So therefore there's no impact. So to say anything other than that within this chamber, it's, it's actually falsifying the situation. And that is hugely problematic when that is going out to the community, when that's not the reality of the situation. So I think as councillors, we have a duty to be making sure that the information going out is accurate. And unfortunately, I said it the last time and I'll say it again, this is where we are. We are talking about one election, and then everything else is scheduled around in service days. We do not want additional costs. And just a further note, when it comes to the Bowness Recreation Centre, is the decisions already be taken by council on the closure of the BRC, then there's going to be work being carried out in that car park where the proposed site for these porter cabins would be. So therefore, that has another impact here at the council. That's all I want to say. Okay, thanks thanks very much, Councillor Devine. Councillor Hutchison, did you have a light on the tobacco? Yeah, I did. Uh, Councillor Ritchie made a good point. I was just going to ask um, Mr Moody for clarification of where the cost would come from this, because it wouldn't be from Falkirk Council. OK, Mr Moody. Or would you prefer to go to Mr Lorry? Oh, Mr Lorry, my apologies. Um, thank you, uh, Provost and uh, Councillor Hitchin. I mean, the position is set out um, in the report under the cons. 
um, in terms of whether the funding will be available or not. We can't always be absolutely clear on that. I suppose what we are um, seeing is a tightening of the regime round about um, election funding, um, which is why we, we put that um, paragraph in uh, the report. So we can't be absolutely certain on it, but the likelihood of getting full costing is reducing over time. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor McIlroy. Thank you, Provost. Just on that final comment there from, from uh, Mr Laurie, um, either way, it's still public money um, that has been used uh, irrespective of whether it comes from government or whether it comes from Falkirk Council. Um, so I think we, we should be mindful of that. I'm sitting here listening to the rain and um, if anyone who has had mobile units within their electoral area um, over the years will know that there is limited capacity actually within the unit um, and um, if it is pouring with rain and it is one of the major elections and there are significant numbers of people uh, choosing to go in person and vote, they may well be standing outside waiting in the, in the rain. Um, therefore, I would much rather see us use alternative buildings wherever possible. Um, and it's good to know that the, the potential is that Dulgrain Hall will re remain, but um, being a, a, an actual brick-built building, um, Grangemouth Rugby Club uh, would be a, a much better venue than a, a mobile unit. Um, it's only a short distance from the, the current Dulgrain Hall, and yes, it is across a, 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 a dual carriageway, but there is a pedestrian crossing there. Um, so um, there is access to that. Um, and again, similarly, um, a, a potential is that the, 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 um, the election is going to be towards the end of the year, um, this year. Um, again, bonus, it would be much better if it was in a, a building where there was space, people could be warm and safe while they're waiting to be able to cast their vote um, and not have to uh, be queuing up outside in the rain, in the cold, in the damp um, for a mobile unit. Um, and... Not the, the, the principal concern, also the staff who have to operate those and, and having a comfortable environment to be in there for such a long period of time. Thank okay, you. Thanks, sir. What's going to make John, any other comments or we'll just go to the vote? Just a, a quick one, if you don't mind, Provost. Yeah, like that. Uh, Councillor Devine brought up a, a relevant question for me with regards to sighting of the units in Bonnes, will they be in the car park area at the, where the current Bonnes Recreation Centre is now? And if so, if that's where they're planned, will there be work ongoing at that time? Do you know? Mr Kefik. Uh, Provost, yeah, there'll be work ongoing at that time. Um, <clears throat> following the closure of the uh, the recreation centre on the, the 3rd of May, uh, we'll be mobilising on site with uh, enabling removal of asbestos works. And whilst we may have areas of the car park that are only being fully utilised, we'd prefer to have full clear access to that area whilst the works are ongoing. Thank you, Thank you very much. OK, if there's no other comments, we'll go to the vote. Oh, Provost, I'm going to start a quick, quick comment from my, myself. I totally agree with Councillor Spears and Councillor Miko John. I really do hope that the Dalgreen Community Hall doesn't close and the public do take it over. We're only proposing the mobile unit in Grangemouth as a just-in-case option. Uh, and again, Hopefully it'll never have to happen. But I'm sure the people at Grangemouth will be looking for something to be put in place at the Dalgrain Community Hall in the event that it does close. They're not going to traipse to the, the Grangemouth Rugby Club. They're not, they're not going to jump on a bus to go to the Grangemouth Town Hall or the Scout Hall for that matter. I'm sure the people at Grangemouth will want something kept local and easily accessible, especially for older and infirm people. Thanks, Provost. And thanks very much, Councillor Nimmo. We'll go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. And the motion is uh, moved by oh, Councillor... So there's Councillor Fleming. Do you speak your hand up now? Apologies, uh, yes. Apologies. Just a quick mention, which I did mention at a recent meeting. Of course, we do have postal voting, and people that haven't registered can register for postal voting and yep. sit comfortably in their homes. And 
you know, put their vote in the post any time before the election. It was just a mention of that because it can be sometimes forgotten. Thanks, Provost. Sorry about the interruption. Okay, okay Councillor Flynn, thank you. So we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. And the motion, which consists of the recommendations, at paragraph two of the report, is moved by Councillor Miko John and seconded by Councillor Garner. Against which there is an amendment moved by Councillor Nimmo and seconded by Councillor Aitchison, which has been circulated. Provost Bissett. Amendment. Councillor Aitchison. Amendment. Councillor Anslow. Amendment. Councillor Binning. Motion. Councillor Bowes. Motion. Councillor Bundy. Abstain. Councillor Colley. Motion. Councillor Deacon. Motion. Councillor Devine. Motion. Councillor Flynn. Abstain. Councillor Forrest. Motion. Councillor Garner. The motion. Councillor Hanna. Amendment. Councillor Kelly. Amendment. Bailey Carr. Abstain. Councillor McCabe. Abstain. Councillor Miko John. Motion. Councillor Murta. Abstain. Councillor Nimmo. Amendment. Councillor Patterson. Amendment. Councillor Patrick. Abstain. Councillor Redmond. Amendment. Councillor Ritchie. Amendment. Councillor Sinclair. Motion. Councillor Spears. Amendment. And Councillor Steinbank. Amendment. Obviously, there are nine votes for the motion. There are 11 votes for the amendment. There are six abstentions. The amendment is carried. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Moody. Um, agenda item 8, proportionality of committee places and appointments to outside bodies. It's a report by Director of Transformation Communities and Corporate Services, page 165 to 170 in your agenda papers. And Mr. Moody will summarise the report and the recommendations. Thank you, Provost. Um, this report comes in two parts. The first part relates to a proposed change in the proportionality on some of the Council's bodies, and the second part are in, uh, relates to appointment to two places on outside uh, bodies which are referred to in the report. So dealing with the first part uh, first, the proportionality change arises because of the resignation of Councillor Brown from the Conservative Group and her new status as an independent member. And the result of that is a gain in membership by independent members across uh, some of the bodies. Those are the bodies with 10 members, the bodies with eight members and the bodies of four members. So the new proposed proportionality is a set out uh, within the report. And it's noted that in relation to independent members, it's for them to decide among themselves as to who would take up that place to be advised to me. The second part of the report relates to places on the Falkirk District Twinning Association and secondly on the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre and there's some information on those bodies within the report. In terms of decision making, uh, Provost, I would suggest, as we've normally done, that we deal with the issue of proportionality first, and then when that's decided, we can move on to seek nominations for the two positions. Okay, thanks, Mr. Moody. We've got Councillor Michael John. Thank you, Provost. Um, I, I would um, move that we agree the suggested allocation of places in the bodies of 10, 8 and 4 as set out in the report. Okay, do you have a second? Councillor Garner. Yeah, happy to second. On the ball this time, Provost. Thanks very much. Um, Councillor Hanna, do you have an amendment? No amendment. Okay. Bailey Kerr? No amendment. Councillor Spears? No amendments. Any other independents have an amendment? No. 
Okay? So, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Thank you. That was quick. And then that takes us on to the second part, uh, Provost, which is just to see if there are any nominations from the floor. First of all, for the Pocket District. Sorry, I apologise. I didn't have my microphone on. Uh, the second part is just to see if there are nominations from the floor for the two bodies. The first of them is the Falkirk District Twinning Association. Councillor Garma. Thank you, Provis. I'd like to propose to Council Leader, Councillor Michael John. Any other nominations? I'd like to propose Councillor Ansville. Any other nominations? No, nope. nope. just go to the vote. OK, we'll just go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. We have two nominations. First, Councillor Miko John, and secondly, Councillor Anslow. So if members would just state their, their uh, preference between uh, the two members. Provost Bissett. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Aitchison. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Anslow. Thank you. Councillor Binney. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Powers. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Bundy. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Colley. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Deacon. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Devine. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Flynn. Councillor Michael John, please. Councillor Forrest. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Garner. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Hannah. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Anslow. Bailey Kerr. Councillor Michael John. Councillor McCabe. Anslow. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Marta. Abstain. Councillor Nimmo. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Patterson. Sorry, Councillor Anslow. Thank you. Councillor Patrick. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Redmond. Freeze had to go. Councillor Ritchie. Abstain. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Michael John. Councillor Spears. Abstain. And Councillor Steinbach. Councillor Anslow. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. There are 13 votes for Councillor Miko John. There are nine votes for Councillor Anslow. There were three abstentions, and Councillor Miko John is duly appointed. Thank you. We turn now, Provost, then to the appointment to the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre, and again a request for nominations from the floor. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I would wish to nominate um, Councillor uh, Ian Sinclair as the Education Portfolio Holder, as has been in the past. That has been um, usually that their particular role in taking part in this organisation. Thank you. Any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Councillor Redmond. Any other nominations? No. Go to the vote. Thank you, Provost. And again, the nominations are for Councillor Sinclair and Councillor Redmond. And if councillors could state their uh, preference, please. So, Provost Bissett. Councillor Redmond. Councillor Aitchison. Councillor Redmond. Councillor Anslow. Councillor Redmond. Councillor Binney. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Bowes. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Bundy. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Colley. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Deacon. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Devine. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Flynn. Councillor Sinclair. 
Ein Sir Forrest. Ja, ich Sinclair. Ein Sir Garner. Ein Sir Sinclair. Ein Sir Hannah. Ein Sir Redmond. Ein Sir Kelly. Ein Sir Redmond. Billy Kerr. Ein Sir Sinclair. Ein Sir McCabe. Stay. Ein Sir Michael John. Ein Sir Sinclair. Ein Sir Marta. Abstain. Ein Sir Nemo. Ein Sir Redmond. Ein Sir Patterson. Councillor Redmond. Councillor Patrick. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Ritchie. Abstain. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Sinclair. Councillor Spears. Abstain. And Councillor Steenby. Councillor Redmond. <laughs> Obviously, there are 13 votes for Councillor Sinclair. There are eight votes for Councillor Redmond. There are four abstentions, and Councillor Sinclair is duly appointed. Hey, thanks very much, Mr. Murray. Um, last item of business agenda item nine execution of deeds. It's a report by Director of Transformation Communities and Corporate Services, pages 171 to 175 in the agenda papers. And Mr. Murray will summarise the report and the recommendations. Thank you, Provost. The report is for information only, but I'll attempt to deal with any questions members have on any of the deeds. Great, Councillor Michael John. Happy to move the recommendations that we approve the report. Do you have a second, though? Happy second, Provost. Councillor Garner. Um, Councillor Hannah? No amendment. Bill Kerr? No amendment. Councillor Spears? No amendment. Any independents have any amendments? Okay. Any questions? I've got 150 questions here, I promise, the next day. Right. <laughs> okay, so, agree the report? Okay. Well, thanks very much for your attendance, it's free to go.